All right, all right. All right, all right. Are we on? My hair's all messed up. Welcome to my world. My hair's all messed up. Let me make sure we got the... Right, right. Let me turn this guy it's off here. Welcome to my world. All right, cool. Hey, Mush Mushki. What's going on, Washington? Kevin K. Paso. What's going on, my friends? Welcome aboard to Right Capital. <laughs> right Capital. Heritage Wealth Planning. We're going to do some Right Capital stuff here. Uh, MDF, hey, right on. Linda K. Paso, Miss Constitutionalist, right on. That's a nice name, Miss Constitutionalist. We'll do some Tampa Right Capital stuff this night. I bet we don't get Rob W. from Daniel Thomas from, uh, I think Thomas, you're up in Massachusetts, aren't you? CJ Poley, right on. Mr. Pablo, right. Mr. Pablo's right behind us. Um, I bet Mark uh, Warner Rob is Mark. Uh, Rob W. from Worcester won't be on because the Pats are playing tonight. Marie, right on, from PA is here. You got Pablo uh, the Pooper. Pablo the Pooper is here. And uh, the Pats are playing the Ravens. A pretty big game. Roy Hobbs, man, for Swanee, right on. The original Roy Hobbs, the natural. Tom, yeah, that's right. Thomas, Thomas, you're not going to watch the Pats? or I know it's not on for another 50 minutes or so, but uh, Starling, right on, Starling. The shoulder, yeah, man, it, uh, it, uh, I got these. Got these little two, three, and five pound balls. And believe it or not, Tom, Harry, what's going on? And you uh, you put them up against the wall and you go like this. And you get, you, man, believe it, a five pound, believe it or not, you do that 30 times each side. It freaking, man, it hurts. It's, uh, it's good. It hurts. And then, uh, you know, you just kind of put them over your head a little bit. And that, uh, right now, it hurts a little bit, though. It's weird. <laughs> get off my lawn. <laughs> I mean, I bet some people are, well, not upset with me, but they're like, dude, this private property. I said, man, I get, I, we've been on this guy's property, you know, this property a million times a Sunday. It's not just us, but, you know, maybe that's why he's so pissed off. But my goodness, I was like, dude, he can he made a beeline from his house way back there over the other side of the pond and made a beeline to tell me and Pablo, get off my lawn. I was like, dude, really? Anyway, all right. I'm going to start off with this, uh, Actually, I wonder if I can hmm. I start off with this banking, the Business Times article. We're going to start off with this. We'll take questions. We'll go into Right Capital. I know a lot of y'all are interested in Right Capital. Yeah, man, if I got slipped in her, good evening. Uh, Chicago Bears got skunked. Yeah, I don't know, Vic. If I got slipped and hurt, uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. I get it. I eh. either way, either way. Got a, hey, but I like that. We got a lot of private property believers on this channel. That's good because I love private property. Love it. Man's got a right to be a punk. I get it. It's his property. You can tell me to get out of Dodge. I get it. I'm just sitting there thinking, dude. I'm just. Uh, I mean, look. I I got no look. I don't like it, but it's his right. He's got a private property. You can do whatever he wants. I got no qualm with that at all. I just uh, I chuckled a little bit just because. Uh, I chuckled a lot, frankly, because the whole point was, dude, it's the freaking woods, dude. Relax. But and when I was look, when I was growing up in Maine, and this is just me, we walked through all the woods. We picked uh, Texas, West Texas, right on Tony. We picked the blueberries from uh, I'm sure other people's land. No one cared. It's just like, dude. But you know, that's uh, you know, that's uh, the Peaks Island, Maine, where I grew up. Maybe it was more uh, communal, I suppose. I don't know. I just always said, eh, either way, be it as it may. All right, so this is from the Business Times uh, dateline, uh, October 31st. Boo, it's not a boo. World record and negative rates has bankers testing no man's land. And so uh, a man uh, emailed me, a guy emailed me, um, asking about what I thought about negative rates. And uh, this has been something that's been on my mind. Bruce, que paso. Yeah, we're a lot more sensitive nowadays. I get it. I mean, the funny thing it was misconstitutionalists is, Look, I'm sure the people on my uh, – what's going on, Gary? I'm sure the people on the channel are more aligned with my thinking on things. Um, I just – the idea that we have private property in this day and age where if you have a wetland, the freaking EPA can say you can't build a bridge. And I'm, what I mean a bridge, I mean a stick-built bridge, not like a bay bridge. 
you can't do anything anymore with your own land. And that's just the idea uh, that there's any such thing as private property rights anymore is silly. I just, the, the, the federal government is so big, so intrusive. They can tell you anything they want and you're, you're done. You're done. In fact, I was watching, um, I think I shared this with you, the lady prepper princess the other day on YouTube. And I, I don't know her. I don't watch all that. She, I don't know her. And I just know she's leaving California for some, whatever reason. I can't, I don't know. I don't follow her that regularly, but I saw this and, uh, it's interesting because she was saying all the regulations that California has to, I almost want to say it's like putting roofing on your house or something like that. I said, this is freaking crazy. I mean, like the government telling you how to live in your own piece of uh, your own American dream. And if you don't, that just is crazy. And I, uh, San Diego, right on, just saw the Chargers spank the, uh, uh, spank the Packers. And, uh, I just, well, I guess San Diego, that's not the Chargers anymore. Jeez, man. I was thinking Dan Faust. Uh, man, I just sitting there thinking it's nuts. The idea of private property. It, uh, it's frustrating to me to know when and it's, uh, it's sad. Nanny stay is right, Greg. And, uh, this idea that we have private property, um, is we don't have it anymore. We hate the Chargers, right? Uh, it was a Spanos. Is that his name? All right. So let's read this real quick. After more than seven years of negative interest rates, some of Denmark's biggest banks are resorting to uncharted territory to cope with the extreme monetary regime. Uh, at Side Bank, uh, Chief Executive Officer Karen Frosser uh, said on Wednesday she's going to need to pass on negative rates to a record number of retail depositors. So the CEO said she's going to need to pass on negative rates to the record number of retail depositors and possibly even cut the rate on their accounts below the central bank's benchmark of minus, minus 75 basis points. So the central bank in Denmark, you know, this is the Nordic, we all want to follow, uh, Denmark's Nordic, right? Some, either way, Northern European, uh, either way, they're saying we're going to pass, there's a uh, 75 basis point, a one, three quarters, 1% 1 negative interest rates in Denmark. And the CEO of one of the largest banks in that country says she's going to pass on negative interest rates to the depositors below even the rate that the central bank is doing. So we're all talking a 1% negative interest rates. Sharing the pain of negative rates with retail depositors, once taboo, is fast becoming the market standard in Denmark. Ms. Frosig said in an interview on Wednesday, she spoke after announcing cost cuts that will hit headcount as life below zero makes it increasingly difficult to run a bank or an insurance company. What's up, Rob? Saw the Steelers one. I freaking hate the Steelers. I'm not a fan of the Colts either, but man, I hate the Steelers. Oh, yeah, yeah. The Canadians, the Steelers. Uh, who else do I hate? In baseball, the Yankees. Can Yankees, Canadians, Steelers. And I don't really care about basketball. I, I guess I can't stand anyone with LeBron James. Any, I, actually, the whole NBA can kiss my butt. Woo, the communists have a right to speak, but don't you dare say anything about freaking Trump. Uh, freaking Steve Kerr, kiss my butt. Uh, what's that guy's name in San Antonio? Kiss my butt. Steal the Jeff Rain Steelers, man. I, I've been watching the Panthers. I watched more football the last two weeks. I've watched probably in two years. Uh, Christian McCaffrey, freaking three touchdowns, man. Jeez, that guy. He's not even that big of a guy. How, I don't get it. I just don't get how that guy does it. All right. No other country has lived with negative rates as long as Denmark, as JISC Bank, uh, the expect at JISC Bank, the expectation is that the policy may last another eight years. Yeah, those who can kiss my butt, right? Uh, it's already led to the dramatic adjustments in the banking world, with more lenders relying on other revenue streams. This was scary. More lenders relying on other revenue streams besides traditional lending to stay profitable. Banks that have mortgage units are the lucky ones as borrowers responding to fall, falling rates by refinancing, incurring uh, fees in the process. Uh, this guy says, the CEO of this one bank says, if you asked me five years ago whether we would have negative interest rates on deposits in Denmark, I wouldn't have ever imagined reaching the point. But now she says she stopped guaranteeing anything. Danish bankers are at the front line of a monetary experiment that's drawing an increasing number of skeptics. In Sweden, the Ricks Bank has made clear it's eager to exit the policy after almost half a decade below zero. In Denmark, the central bank uses negative rates for the sole purpose of defending the krones pegged to the euro. Uh, some, 
I can't pronounce their names, but some guy at uh, one of these big banks says, how far the bank goes at requiring retail clients to accept negative rates depends on the biggest picture, bigger picture. It depends on the market. Uh, we've historically had a positive margin. All right, so the point about banking, what's up, Jimmy? Hey, Brian, another Pittsburgh guy. Um, the, the issue that we have here is that the negative rates, uh, you can't run a bank or even an insurance company on negative rates. It's just, I mean, you can run it, but you're going to, I mean, net interest income, net interest income is how banks make their money. And, and how that is basically you loan, you're borrowing from the Fed at two, you're loaning at four, and that difference is your spread. And that's your net interest income, essentially. Or you're borrowing, uh, you're loaning, you're, I mean, you're borrowing from a deposit at two and you're loaning out at four. So you're taking a CD in at two and you're loaning out at four. That's the spread and that's how they make their money. And uh, this is interesting. I, I don't know where this is going to go. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's what, what it tells me is probably more speculation on the bank's part, I would think. And, uh, and more speculation in real estate particularly. Uh, simply because, yeah, credit cards rates are twenty percent, and isn't that where they make their money? Well, there's not, 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 not. There's not that many debtors that are. Uh, a credit card is a signature loan essentially, and there, you know, you might be able to borrow fifteen percent, a uh, fifteen thousand that guy, fifteen thousand that guy. But in mass, credit card loans aren't huge relative to corporate loans and things of that nature. It's funny though. I get freaking crap every single day from these banks. They can all kiss my butt because I remember in 2007 and eight, how they did me and they might've done you too. And I got no sympathy for them whatsoever. But at the end of the day, if NII net interest income goes down, their P and L statement, the profit and loss statement is going to look weak. And if that looks weak, you can't keep a lot of head count. That's uh, they just can't, you're going to be hard pressed to find. I, I don't know. You're, you're, they're going to speculate. Speculation will always come when the rates are, rates are this low. And if you have more and more speculation, that means there's going to be more and more downside potentially. I just listened to my man, uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, when I was taking Opabo out for his most recent walk. Let me show it to you. Um, this one right here, anti-fragile. And, uh, and he said, it was interesting because he said, uh, um, the fragility, i.e. Uh, being, being fragile, being broken uh, in of itself, you got to, you don't want to get killed, but, you know, to take on some risk in order to develop more and more uh, like strength, you're going to tear down muscle in order to build back your muscle is actually worth it to the, to the fight for an economy, which doesn't have any risk taking or anything like that is bad. His point, though, was at the end of the day, it all comes back to debt. Uh, debt, if you have the debt, you, it makes you less inclined to be uh, to take any risk for sure, because you're more you're, you're tied to the, you know, your your corporate boss and things of that nature. So debt. And I'm telling you, I'm living the proof of that. And it's, it's actually pretty interesting, because if you have all kinds of debt, uh, you're you <laughs> you you can take less of a of a hit for sure because you got to pay the debt back and so i'm going to it'd be interesting to see these banks and what they do when they start taking on more and more debt uh or being more and more speculative in nature and and what that leads to it, it bad things are going to come i mean look we've seen this a million times so uh, what is that i don't know i don't know what that means what should you do i just again it's just pay down debt that's what i'm working on man i'm working on like a crazy man paying down debt because you know, I had a, a bunch of people um, say, I don't have any concern about the amount of debt in the U.S. And I do. I mean, I have huge concerns about the debt level. Absolutely. I, I mean, in and of itself, the concerns, my concerns are irrelevant. It doesn't mean anything. Your concerns are relevant, too. But, you know, a bunch of people posted in the comments like, oh, you're not concerned about the debt. Uh yeah, I am concerned about the debt, but what are you going to do about it? And the way I deal with that is I pay off my debt as much as I can. Trust me, this house behind me, there's still a big fat mortgage on it. Uh, but, you know, I'm working on it. man. And uh, I mean, what are you going to do? You can't invest. You're not going to invest in the stock market because you're worried about the debt. I don't I don't understand that you're going to invest in bonds. Uh, maybe you can invest in gold. I get that. But I, I don't think that's I, I personally don't think that's a good move other than maybe five to 10 percent of your liquid assets. Um, so what are you going to do And the way you, I think you should think about it. If a debt is a concern is not, not to invest in equities, uh, but is to, is invest in yourself by paying down debt and finding ways you can secure an income stream. If hell hits, you know, if, if, if we, if, if, if things go to hell in a handbasket and the way you can get income streams is, I mean, a bunch of different things, but a small thing here, small thing there, small thing there, small thing there can add up for sure. And that's why I did the video on my book the other day that I made 5,000 bucks this year on books. I mean, that's not a huge amount of money, but I've only had them published for 18 months. And if you keep doing it, keep doing it, there's a good chance you could make some money. 
And uh, anyway, that's just my thought process on it. Uh, so yeah, so someone said about annuities, we can uh, uh, we can certainly uh, talk about annuities, Pete, if you want, if you have a specific on that as well. Um, yeah, I saw the yeah, uh, Warren's freaking thing. I know a valley. Where are you, fear that you don't have to tell me specific town. You in Augusta County, Rockham County? Where you at, brother? Um, uh, Elizabeth Warren thing is uh, is nuts. Uh, there's just no getting around that. Uh, I mean that that she's talking about taxing unrealized gains. I mean, if you want to, uh, I mean, literally, if you want to kill the market, tax unrealized gains. That's just that. I, I sat there and I. I, the level of insanity, and then I was reading an article today on a Powerline blog, and they're saying she's even talking about taxing unrealized gains in uh, uh, in your 401ks. And I, I just, and I don't know that to be true, but I was reading this, so that can't possibly, she can't be that stupid. I mean, maybe, I mean, she probably is, but I'm sitting there thinking, is she really advocating taxing unrealized gains in 401k plans? I, I just, it boggles the mind. Uh, taxing unrealized uh, gains it just it's freaking it's insane that's insanity that's insanity but hey more power to her. i'm glad she's doing it because there's no way she's gonna win um <laughs> i just sit there i i, I boggles the mind the lack of political skill set and that and I, I just you know the thing with uh with clinton and obama is you know clinton was a political genius there's no other way around that uh, hillary was not but bill clinton was obama had you know he had the wind at his back more so than uh than elizabeth warren does and, and i think obama's success allow some of these on the left uh, not to understand the political ramifications of some of the positions that they're taking. And it's good. I mean, it's good for me who don't like those guys, but I just, I, I chuckle at the, the absurdity of taxing unrealized gains and even proposing that. And she's doing it to get the nomination, but all that's, I just, it's, it's, it's crazy. I, I, <laughs> I couldn't be happier, frankly. I just, I, I, I'm stunned how absurd this uh, proposal is. But be it as it may, we'll just uh, we'll cross that bridge when we come. That, what else did she say? She wanted to tax. She wanted to get rid of fracking, tax unrealized gains, and allow for uh, Medicare for all, including illegal immigrants. Ooh, I mean, Obama would never go down that road. It's nuts. Um, Clinton never would have. <laughs> uh, crazy. No, we're dealing with crazy times. All right, Popovich can, you know, Augusta County. Yeah, beautiful Augusta County, man, down there in Stanton. If y'all like meat, you go to my man, uh, uh, drawing a blank now, uh, Polyface Farms, Polyface Farms out in, uh, out west of Stanton, Joel Salton, Joel Salton, Polyface Farms out west of Stanton. He's a libertarian pro-Christian or Christian, uh, uh, farmer out there who sells a lot of meat on his pro on his property, which he, he raises and slaughters himself. And Joel Salton's farm out, Polyface Farms out west of Stanton. Uh, the guy's just freaking awesome. I love Christian libertarians. They're my favorite kind of people in the world. Uh, I just, I love them. So I'm a fan of Joel Salton and uh, Polyface Farms. All right. All right. So, uh, Elizabeth Warren. All right. So let's talk about this. Uh, we had, uh, Tom says, had a discussion about asset allocation. Dude said bonds. All right, so Tom says, uh, guy said, bonds and CDs should be put in a tax deferred account first. Well, I completely agree with that. Roth account second. I don't, well, I see, I don't have any, Tom, I don't have any big thoughts of that. And Roth uh, and a brokerage account third. I think what he's doing is he's saying, look, at the end of the day, the uh, the bonds and CDs are taxed as ordinary income. So we're trying to avoid the ordinary income and instead have it coming out for Roth tax free. Uh, whereas a brokerage account be taxed as OI. I don't have any, I don't necessarily have any qualm with that. I, I wouldn't put any bonds on Roth, no way. I, I, I mean, I wouldn't put any, ideally, I wouldn't have any bonds in a brokerage account either, frankly, or CDs for that matter. But, you know, let's just say you have, you need more bonds than what your IRA or tax deferred account could have. Um, check it on a little. All right. Okay. Interesting. He's looking at me. I see you. a little bathroom poopy or bedroom poopy guy does there. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I don't have any overall qualm with that, Tom. I just, you know, I, my hope would be that your tax deferred accounts should be enough to hold all your bonds and, and CDs. And that's, that's what I'd hope. And that should be for the vast majority of people because the vast majority of wealth is in 401k tax deferred accounts. Um, 
Uh, so uh, just saw this right here. Uh, you have 40, uh, let's see, hold on just a sec. Uh, example, you have 40K, 20,000 bonds, 20,000 stocks to invest in a Roth and brokerage account. Uh, uh, where do you, okay, so you'll have Roth and, and brokerage account. Yeah, I, yeah, Tom, I, I agree with that. So Tom says if you have 20K and 20K and you'll have Roths and a brokerage account, a Roth account and a brokerage account, uh, you'd put, Tom says, you'd put the uh, bonds and the brokerage and stocks and Roth. Yeah, maybe. I, I, I tend to agree with that for sure. I just, eh, I, I, uh, how many people are only going to have that? I don't think that many. But let's just say you did and you needed to have CDs. Um, I, I, would, I would still probably tend to agree with you. But, you know, I don't know because I'd have to see what Social Security looks like and what other kind of income. Because if you put the bonds in the brokerage account and it gives you ordinary income, uh, that could flow into your social security and make your social security tax. So we're going to go over an example and write capital here in just a second. Uh, Pete Stone, uh, do you recommend annuities more for singles with no heirs? Um, I'm going to assume we're talking about income annuities, Pete, uh, Pete the cat. Um, hmm. I was thinking about, I've been thinking about this quite a bit because I've been uh, talking to my friend Robin about annuities as a, as, as the thing. She has heirs, but she's more just concerned about herself. Um, and I was thinking about this just myself, like when you, with, uh, when you go like back to. So I, and I'm, I'm going to do a video on this, um, but one of the things I find interesting, and I think is overlooked a lot. And going back to a, a guy, my man from Texas, who's moving to uh to the state of Oklahoma, who knows who he's talking about. But anyway, if you do an income annuity, all right, and uh, and you don't have a worry about your kids or heirs, an income annuity makes sense. But remember, if you're only getting a 5.5% distribution rate, just for simplicity, that's 5,500 bucks on 100,000. Does that make sense? So we're taking, we're gonna get a 5.5% distribution rate. You know, that $100,000 divided by 5,500, you gotta survive 18 uh, years just to make any money off that. So, you know, if you're not gonna survive 18 years or you have a good thought process that you're not, um, you know, you could actually take more out by just tapping in your principal, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, I, an income, I'm a huge fan of income annuities, huge. Um, but the facts are they're not, it's going to take a, almost two decades to make money off those. So that makes sense, Pete. And because of that, it's like, if you, you're, you're sacrificing liquidity, um, under the hope that you're going to survive roughly two decades. And, and I, I mean, literally, if you just, I'm going to screw this up, but if you just put a hundred thousand dollars into a, uh, present value, bear me just a second, zero future value. Let's just say you got 3%. Uh, and you're taking six thousand dollars out. Yeah, that. So if you got, if you're putting a hundred thousand dollars in and you're taking six thousand dollars a year out, and you got three percent interest, you'd get twenty two and a half years on that. Is that so? You you'd have access to your liquidity, plus you'd you'd make you'd get more uh, long term potential. If that makes sense. So again, you got a hundred thousand dollars in an income annuity. You have no liquidity whatsoever. You're you're only getting fifty five hundred a year on that. All right, now you're going to get that from you know for as long as you're alive. So that's a huge benefit there. But it's going to take roughly twenty years before you start making money. But you sacrifice liquidity. If you have a hundred thousand dollars and you get three percent interest a year, now we're not talking taxes or anything. Um, and then you you're taking six thousand a year out. So you're taking six percent a year out. And obviously this is very linear, but I don't think 3% is over the top and as assuming that you can get a 3% bond for, for, for instance. Um, and you're, you're taking 6,000 out a year, that money will last you for 22 and a half years. That's gone, I mean, it's gone, don't get me wrong. That thing is kaput, but you still have access to liquidity. Now the drawback is in, in the year 23, the bond is gone and the, the annuity is still paying you 5,500 a year. Um, it's a tough one. But anyway, going back to what I'm saying about heirs, I actually don't think an income annuity is a bad thing when it comes to heirs. So let me just give you the example that my man from Texas was using, which I had never even thought about. 
let's just say you got a million bucks just for simplicity and you're going to do an income annuity for a million bucks and it's going to pay you 5,500, right? Yeah, that'd be, uh, how much will it pay you a year? Hold on a second. That'd be 55,000 a year, right? Yeah. So that'd be 55,000 a year. And let's say you only need 40,000 a year to live on. I'm just, for simplicity, I'm just using that. So it's paying 55,000 a year flat. You need 40,000 a year to live on. So you got this flat 50, let me just let me draw this. All right. So I, as you can tell, I'm thinking in this as I'm yapping here. So it's, that's why it's not all as uh, crisp as you might like, but I'm not a crisp kind of guy. So you got, oh, it's not dark enough. You got, uh, there you go, black, all right, sweet. You got 55, oh, it's still not very dark. Uh, hold on just a second. Hope I'm not losing people. All right, there we go. So you got 55,000 a year, just flat, right? So it's 55,000 a year. And you got 40,000 a year of spending. All right, so you got 55,000 a year is what the income is. You got 40,000 a year of spending. So initially, your 55,000 a year is significantly higher than 40,000 a year spending, but because it's an income annuity, it stays flat. You don't, I mean, it doesn't grow, it just stays flat. Well, the cost of living is going up each and every year until finally the spending overtakes the annuity, all right? So, what, you know, let's just say that's 20 years from now. In the interim, you have this extra $15,000 that you have. And, and this is just a real simple example. You have this extra $15,000 uh, that you're able to spend that, that you don't need to spend because your spending is only 40,000 bucks. And let's just say you do want to leave some money to your heirs, be it your spouse or be it your kids or be, or, you know, be it old buddy Pablo. Well, in that case, you could buy a life insurance policy. All right. And I think this gets underutilized way too much. You can buy a second to die and a second to die life insurance policy is where it covers Josh and Charlotte. And I, I'm telling you, man, I, I used to, this was one of those this estate planning concepts that people hear life insurance they, or annuities, they run for the hills. I just, I wish they would not. So a life, we'll just say a second to die life insurance policy. Let's say it costs $5,000 a year for 25 years. I'm just using it. I literally have no idea. We'll say there's a $250,000 death benefit. All right. So for what I say, 250,000 bucks. And I, again, I have no idea, but it's cost 5,000 a year for 25 years. All right. So whatever that 25 times five, that's 125,000 bucks. Just, I have no clue what these numbers are. I'm just pulling it out of my head. So you're going to spend $5,000 a year for 25 years. And when you die, 250,000 will go to your kids or your heirs, anybody, Pablo, tax free. All right. Now, if you do it correctly, we, that will be a guaranteed second to die policy. Now, what happens is on a second to die policy, they don't pay out at the death of the first spouse. So if I die as a man who's older uh, than my wife, I will go first. It won't pay to Charlotte. It only pay to my kids once Charlotte dies. And so what happens here is you're saying the, the benefit about a life insurance. And I was talking to my man from Mexico the other day, and uh, he was asking about universal life policies. And I know I'm going on way down a rabbit hole. But I said, look, if you're young and you can fund these suckers, I'm a big fan of UL policies. I'm a big fan of U whole life, but I'm such I'm even a bigger fan of universal life. Uh, but you got to be able to fund these guys. And what I mean funding is you got to put some money into there on the front end while you're young and in good shape and the cost of insurance is low. And, uh, and I've done videos where I disparage universal life insurance policies because the older ones are freaking, they're doomed because they were issued when the interest rates are so much higher and they've since gone way down. Long story short, at the end of the day, you say, okay, I'm going to take an income annuity. All right. If I don't spend all the income from the income annuity because I'm taking off more income than I need, but I do want to leave two heirs, there's a, I have guaranteed income annuity money. And I could buy a second to die life insurance policy that covers Charlotte and Josh, which will be guaranteed to pay out at my at her death, Charlotte's death, uh, you know, X amount of dollars. And so, so you have take completely taken any risk off the table for running out of money or for uh, leaving a legacy. It's I just think it's a, a such an underutilized strategy. And then you can create a legacy, too, because simply you can basically what you're doing with life insurance is you're buying you know, two dollars of life insurance of assets when you die for every dollar you're spending, essentially it is, you know, I hate to say leverage. It's not a leverage like a, a margin, but it's a leverage where you're donating, you're investing a buck and you're going to get two bucks out. Well, you won't, but your heirs will. Anyway, so that's one of the benefits I was thinking for me as I go down because I have we, we don't anymore. 
but I'm going to get one again, but I second to die life insurance policy for Char and me. And I said, you know, it's a great, great way to, to leave money and reduce some of the risk on, on top of that, incorporating an income annuity as well. And then when my man was telling me about using income annuity right out the gate to basically take risk off the table, you know, because essentially he doesn't, he doesn't want to retire until 25 to 35 to 55 percent bear market. Doing an income annuity is, man, I just I think it's a great I think it's a great strategy. The drawback is what I just said. It's going to take you 20 years for you to make money off it. And there's so there's no right answer, but it's more than just single people for sure. But if I'm single and I don't want to run out of money. And I want to make sure that I don't I can sleep at night because the market is killing me or scare me. An income annuity freaking just inherently makes sense. I, I, I literally it's there's no risk other than the solvency of the insurance company that issues the debt of uh, issues the product. And that's that that's the least of my concerns. Anyway, I, I know that's a uh, a long litany there, but uh, it's something I'm interested in quite a bit. And, and I'm gonna model this more. The drawback about let me just share with you real quick. So what happened back in the day, just when I'm off, off going off a tangent, is they were issuing universal life policies, which is literally um, the risk is on you. The whole life, the risk is on the insurance company. With universal life, the risk is on you. That had a current yield or current interest rate. I'm just going to say current yield of 8%. All right. So back in the late 80s, early 90s, they were issuing these universal life policies. And they said, hey, Dr. Smith, if you pay $5,000 a year for 25 years, you'll have a million dollar death benefit uh, that you can transfer to your heirs tax free. And Dr. Smith's like, damn, that's great. I only spend 125,000 bucks, but I get a million dollars at my death to uh, my heirs, which means I can worry less about you know, the 4% rule and all that because I, I have my heirs taken care of with his life insurance policy. But the problem is when the interest rates went from eight down to five, now they're down to freaking two. And I think some are even paying less than that. The, the, the interest rates of 8%, which is what the contracts are based on, uh, were, were showing that if the 8% continued, you'd only have to pay $5,000 a year. But if the interest rates drop, and that corresponds to the time where you're getting older and the cost of insurance is going up. So in this case, you have your interest rates dropping. So you have your interest rates going down. And then you have your cost of insurance, what's called COI, going up. All right. So when you took the policy out, your COI, your cost of insurance was low because you were young and the interest rates are high. But as you get older, the cost of insurance goes up each and every year significantly. And yet the, at the same time, the interest rates drops. So now you have this big gap where it, there was not, you didn't think there'd be a gap when you took out the policy because the guy made it seem like the policy was fully funded. And it was if the interest rate stayed at 8%. Um, I just dropped something, but they didn't. And so now you got a freaking life insurance policy, universal life policy that, uh, that that's not as doomed. It's, it's not long for this world. And then you're going to, you will, the policy will expire before you do. I, I, that's why I'm against universal life policies because a lot of people were underfunding them. They I either saying the insurance company required 5,000 bucks a year to really make this policy funded. And yet you're only put 3,000 a year in, or you took some time off from funding it, or you borrowed against it and whatnot. And, uh, and all that, on top of the increasing cost of insurance and, cre and the decreasing interest rates make the policies uh, just, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna die. So now what I say, what I was telling my man in Mexico, I said, look, if you get a universal life policy, well, the interest rates are down here. Now they're already down here. I don't know if they're gonna go up, but the, the policy, uh, the, you can't illustrate a policy with an interest rate way up here if it's way down here. And so we're already showing low rates on the policy illustrations for sure. And because this guy's young, his cost of insurance is low too. So in this case, both his cost of insurance is low and his interest rates are low. So the cost of insurance is going to go up. Sure. The interest rates may or may not go up. I don't know. I mean, they might go, who knows? But at the end of the day, we know the illustration will take into the increasing cost of insurance with a pretty flat interest rates that we're going to assume, which means you can, I don't want to say you can trust the insurance, the illustration, but you have a pretty good gauge at the illustration that you're going to see uh, will be legit for many, many years to come because the cost of insurance, as you get older, the, the life insurance costs more money. There's no other way around that. 
Uh, if the interest rates stay flat, well, you'll see right now how much it's going to cost you to make sure this policy stays in force. But if the interest rates go up, and I don't know, I don't know if the interest rates are going up. That's a that's the qualm. I don't know. It's crazy. I mean, I think they are, but then I, I don't know. You'd think they'd have to at some point, but I've been saying that for freaking uh, forever. And I haven't gone up. It's just me, buddy. So anyway, the point about that was uh, universal life policies, in my opinion, now are a better bet by far than whole life because the likelihood of the interest rates falling for universal life policies is pretty nil relative to what it was 15, 20 years ago. But the likelihood of them going up is, is substantially higher than they were 15, 20 years ago. In whole life, the drawback of a whole life is literally you know exactly what your contract is. It's literally for your whole life. So if you're getting a 3% guaranteed interest rate, that won't change because that's what the insurance company is basing their contractual obligation on. I didn't mean to go down this tangent on life insurance. All right, let's go down. Uh, oops, hey buddy, it's okay. Okay, cool, you got sound, Whew, that's good. All right, hold on a second. Uh, Polyface Farms, right on, man. Can't explain uh, how to fund Medicare for all. Uh, Miss Constitutionalist says she loves atheist libertarians. Oh, <laughs> not me. I don't. I love all people, right? <laughs> I just crack me up, atheist. Because there's you can't prove God exists, Josh. No, you can't prove God doesn't exist. Well, I can't prove a negative. No, but then you can also sit there and say, I, no, I get that. I get that. You can't prove a negative. But at the same time, you have no clue what happens to this thing called your conscious once you're in your tomb. You have no idea. You can't prove it just sits there any more than I can prove God exists. So let's just agree. We can't prove each other's theme, feelings and both say we're basing it on faith. I'm okay with that. A lot of atheists are not. Agnostics, I, I have more respect for than atheists because at least athe agnostics says they just don't know. Atheists sound, we got the science on our side. We got Stephen Hawking's and Richard Dawkins and whatnot. I'm like, what's that guy? Yeah, Sam Harris. I'm like, no, you guys don't know any more than I do. And yet, but at the end of the day, the atheists act like science is on their side. And they don't know. <laughs> There's nothing better than getting an atheist fired up. Nothing better. I guess there is. This will be better because uh, socialists fired up. That bores me um, because that's easy. Uh, atheists, atheists are fun because they do have a, like my man Sticks, Sticks Hammer, whatever his name is. Uh, he's mo a lot of atheists. I don't want to say most. A lot of atheists are actually they, they're thinking. I think they are thinkers, and I appreciate that with atheists. They're thinkers. Um, a lot, unlike a lot of the climate change people, are just they're not thinkers. They're just followers. I think atheists are thinkers, for sure. I think a lot of atheists, unfortunately, had a bad uh, church experience, uh, and a lot of Christians got away with the old past of not having to know their own faith, and that's not good. And so uh, I think a lot of atheists ask questions that a Christian uh, could not answer. And unfortunately, many people are too arrogant to say, you know, I don't know. And because of that, the atheist says, well, that's not good enough for me. I need to learn. And then they went and they found people like uh, Richard Dawkins um, and th stuff like that. And because Richard Dawkins is a world famous bio, I think he's a biologist. They said, oh, my goodness, science. And, and then they're, they're gone. And some of these guys will come back for sure. But, uh, but at least I like atheists because they're thinkers. Atheists come across an arrogant bunch, but I, you know, I, I don't fault them for that because I can see them in their background saying, well, you think we were arrogant. You should have seen Christians 20 years ago. I, I, I don't disagree with that, unfortunately. Climate scientists are just uh, scientists or climate change. Uh, oh, speaking of which, I'm interviewing Mich M Michelle Sterling from Friends of Science in Canada on Tuesday. Oh, I can't wait. Friends of Science YouTube channel. I, oh, I cannot wait to interview her. She is fantastic. Michelle Sterling. So heads up, watch that video. It'll be a, a video thing where we see each other's face and whatnot. I cannot wait to interview Michelle Sterling from, uh, uh, from Canada, Friends of Science. Oh, it's freaking awesome. Um, anyway, so good stuff. But Miss Constitutionalist, man, I got no qualm with you, my friend. Uh, I'm libertarian with a low L. But I'm also 100% American nationalist as well. And uh, I too, of course, I do believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And because of that, 
I say, hmm, if Jesus rose from the dead and he predicted it, mm, you probably want to follow that guy. But there's more to my story than that. And I'll share that. I've, I've shared before, but I want to share it now. Uh, my man says, fall is upon us in Ohio. Loving it, dude. Freaking, is there any better than I love fall? Oh, it's just freaking awesome. Uh, hi, all. Popping and say hi. Taking a break from work. Maybe I can gain some knowledge. Says Jerry. Ain't going to gain knowledge here, man. This is knowledge free zone. Jerry's got a good uh, YouTube channel, so check him out. GW Life TV. Uh, what companies do I like? Uh, do we jump back in time? On the, I, Mike, did you say that last time? Last week, someone said the same thing. Do we jump back in time? Um, I don't know what's going on there. That's odd to me. But some, I think it might have been you, actually. Someone said the exact same thing last week. Do we jump back in time? So I'm not sure what's happened there. So my, uh, I, don't, I don't know what youtube is maybe they're they don't like me um what companies do i like yeah that's man see i worked at usaap for many years and when you have those kind of strong ratings you know northwestern mutual i like who's my man work for he works for not metlife uh, metlife got out of the business hold on just a second um uh i'm gonna recommend and i hope i can do this not get this guy in trouble um my, I have a good friend in the business. Hold on just a second. I'm going to bring him up here. Is Matt, Matt Life, Mass Mutual. Mass Mutual, that's what it was. But I'll recommend Magnolia. Magnolia Wealth. Is that Wealth? Hold on a second. Wealth Strategies. Hold on just, yeah. Magnolia Wealth Strategies. Um. Uh, they're mass mutual i'm a fan of uh northwestern mutual mass mutual notice the the two uh, names in there mutual means they're owned by the shareholders or owned by the 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 insured i should say usa yeah, kind of a mutual company um the for-profit ones uh, trans is trans america i don't know uh ohio national i think ohio national's not doing so great now but i mass mutual and Northwestern Mutual are good. I've always liked Protective uh, for life insurance. I'm not sure what they have on annuities. I just like Protective. They're you know they're knee deep in the South. Their client service was fantastic. They always seem to have good rates, but not the best. I've always been a fan of uh, Protective. They were just always friendly. Um, uh, TIA, USAA. Seems like there's one other I'm thinking. Anyway, um, if I can find my man here. Uh, hold on just a second. Yeah, mass. Okay, so if you look, this this is my friend, Ma uh, Magnolia Wealth Strategies, and I don't get paid from my man Rich. Uh, Rich is the guy who runs it. Uh, Rich, uh, he's a West Point grad, so don't hold that against him. Um, he and I went all up and down the East Coast doing seminars together. Just a good good guy. Uh, he lives in Louisiana. Big LSU fan. Oh. Mm. We've had many a debate on many different things, old Rich and I did. And, uh, you know, I was in, I was, uh, in the infantry as a uh, private, and then I went all the way up to corporal. And he was, a, uh, I think, a chemical engineer, and I forgot what his MOS was in the Army. But, you know, we just a good guy. So, anyway, if you're in that, and you don't have to be in Louisiana, but Magnolia Wealth Strategies, if you're looking at insurance, I'd, I'd talk to Rich. And, look, I can't give you any guidance on pro – I don't know what he – products and stuff like that. I've been trying to get him on the interview – the interview one of these days the problem is on these freaking regulatory in stuff and uh, my man sergio pointed this out the other day on a, on a comment the regulatory environment on this kind of stuff is so insane that basically they're keeping just common sense languaging uh from average people and, and i and i i almost wonder if it's a capture uh, if you if you if the the problem with big government big business is this, this capture mentality. I work for the uh, the telecommunications industry and then I go into telecommunications regulation. And then I take care of all the people in the telecommunications industry as a regulator. Then I go back as a highfalutin paid guy in the telecommunications industry. And I, I have all my contacts back in the telecommunications government regulatory agencies. And so this whole capture thing is, is bad, man. And um, and with FINRA and the regulatory agencies, you know, I, I, I just, I hate it because 
people can't say just regular people stuff, man. People are, 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 their hands are tied. And so my man, Rich, if I said, dude, I want to interview and ask you a real life question. Was, I, I just, I, I gotta be careful what I say. So it's all freaking boilerplate. The stuff you just want to kill yourself. You're like, dude, this is so, so bad. Now when he talks to you, it's not like that. Uh, but to get some guidance out there to people that need it, well, hell, it's like you can't say freaking if you say uh, you bless you. Next thing you know, Finn was on you say, well, what if people are atheists like Miss Constitutionalist and she don't want to hear that? You should say nothing. You're like, this is freaking nuts. Anyway, so the point is it's very, very. And there's, you know, I have a I won't call her friend so much, but a lady named Liz Hand uh, out of uh Canton, Ohio, Liz Hand. And um, and she had a YouTube channel that was actually bigger than mine uh, you know, probably a year and a half ago. And I said, man, and, uh, and I, but I said, you're not doing enough. You're not, you didn't open up for comments and you're not doing enough posts. I said, you're, you know, there's not enough women. And I, I hate to sound like that because I, I don't believe we need women for the sake of women. I just think there is a different perspective that women have when it comes to finance. And I think it's interesting and I'd like to hear more. And I said, there's not enough women doing this stuff. And, um, and I wish you'd do more. And she goes, I can't. I can't. Compliance and the regulators, or they won't let me do. Like, this is freaking nuts. How is this helping anybody? It's not helping anybody. It freaking pisses me off. I actually despise that. So my man, Rich, who I'd love to get on to talk about life insurance and annuity strategies, because that is literally what he does. He can't. I mean, I'm sure he could, but it just has to be couched in such a way that, you know, we couldn't even say the sky's blue without getting a compliance officer to agree. It's freaking nuts. Which is why when I have Amar on, we have to do that stupid disclosure that no one listens to, no one cares, and just sitting there thinking this. Hey. Anyway, by the way, Amar and I will be live on uh, every Wednesday at noon. I think it's noon or one Eastern time. I can't remember because he's in California. Eh? Anyway, so we'll be live streaming every Wednesday uh, right around lunch. Um, we're going to talk article. We're going to look at some articles and go over those next time. So if you have good articles, send them to me, but keep doing that. Cause I got this list of articles I want to do ch uh, videos on, but if you have something that comes to mind that you think would be good for Amar and I to talk about it as well, by all means, let me know. All right. Uh, my man, uh, Hey, silver man, I haven't seen you around for a while. I'm self-employed. What is my schedule? C uh, amount listed on my 1040 why is my schedule c amount list on my 1040 never same ah, man I, I don't know you'd have to why is my schedule c amount list on my 1040 never the same amount list on my social security yearly earnings record yeah i i don't know man um sorry yeah tenure versus a spia uh, or do so jay snyder uh, D snyder's a uh, long lost brother you know who d snyder is right we're not gonna take it that was a pretty bad album. Um, that the bad, not in good way. But the old Twisted Sister before they did all that silly stuff was actually pretty good, man. You can't stop rock and roll. Can't stop. Can't you stop it? That was uh, that was pretty good back in the day. And then, you know, the '80s came around, and all what were previously metal became insane, and you just wanted to kill yourself. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. '80s. Some guy on my YouTube channel said '80s music was the bomb and 90 sucked. I said, oh, oh, I had to ban him. I didn't actually. All right. So uh, my man, Jay Snyder or lady Jay Snyder says, what about a reverse mortgage for a tenure all right, versus a uh, SPI annuity? So reverse mortgage tenure just means it pays for the life of the, the as long as you occupy that house, you get paid. That's all there is to it. Um, or why not both? I mean, so the way I look at it, Jay Snyder, um, I, for me, and look, I'm 49, so take this with a grain of salt. But when I hit 62, I absolutely can envision uh, doing a SPIA at that point. SPIA is an income annuity, by the way, a single premium income or immediate. I could be synonymous uh, annuity. That's what a SPIA is. Um, and so a SPIA is just a, a pays you a monthly income stream that you can't outlive. And a 10 year home equity conversion mortgage, a reverse mortgage does the exact same thing. Um, my inclination in that regard would go to the, the SPIA route, but not eh, just because the drawback about the, uh, the, the reverse mortgage is that you're going to tap, tap into your equity big time as you borrow against it. Just don't get around that. I mean, you're going to tap into it significantly to the extent that you may not have any equity um, later on down the road. Now, you will never have as a non-recourse loan. I just want to be clear on that. I can't tell you how many people don't still don't get this. And that's fine. That gives you know the reason why I like to tout reverse mortgages. You 
nor your heirs will ever owe more than uh, what you uh, what your house is worth. So just be advised. And the reason we know that is because the government charges you 2% on the front end, not against the loan amount or your line amount, but against the appraised value of your home. So if you have a home that's appraised at 3,000, 30, uh, 300,000 bucks, you're going to pay six, uh, what did I say? Three, yes, yeah, $3,000, I was it. If you have a home that's appraised at 300,000 bucks, you're going to pay $6,000 as a mortgage insurance premium right out the gate. There's no getting around that because it's based on the appraised value of your home. And then you're paying 50 basis points each and every month as a mortgage insurance premium. That money doesn't just filter out there. That money goes so that way you or your heirs will never owe more than what your debt is. And the, the reverse mortgage it's pretty simple. I do a lot of these in my course. What did I do my anyway? So basically, you're going to say have three hundred thousand dollars is your fair market value, and your principal limiting factor if you're sixty two years old, let's say forty three percent for simplicity. So three hundred thousand dollars times 0.43. You have one hundred and twenty nine thousand is your loan amount. That's that's how much you can borrow. All right. So you got 300,000 is your fair market value. We'll say you're 62. You have 129,000 that you can borrow against. So let's just say you took the whole thing out. Well, the cost of this is right now about five and a half percent. So that sucker is growing pretty fast each and every year. Let's just say you only get 2% a year of increase on your fair market value on your, on your home's uh, net worth. Well, at some point these are going to cross. And so the, the, the debt that you owe will be higher than the fair market value of your home. It doesn't matter because you are locked in to whatever this debt amount is, regardless, regardless, of, I mean, whatever, you can never owe more, excuse me, than, as I'm doing this kind of back ass, but you can never owe more than what the fair market value is. So that makes sense. So because of that, you, you know that you'll never leave your kids a debt. I, I, I'm, a lot of people think I don't wanna leave my kids a day. Well, you don't. And that's the whole thing with the uh, the reverse mortgage. That That's that's why you're paying such a high premium on the front end uh, for the pri privilege of using your equity. I want to point out, and I think a lot of people don't understand this, and I, and I wish they would. Let's just say you're 62 for simplicity and you have a $300,000 house, okay? And I say, man, you should really look at doing a reverse mortgage. And you're like, man, I don't want to pay uh, $6,000 and, and mortgage insurance premium fee. I don't want to pay that kind of money on a mortgage insurance fee. I, I'll see, I might do that later on though. You know, as I get older, if I run out of money, I might do that later on. So now we'll say you're 75 and your house is worth $450,000. Well now times 0.02, that's a $9,000 fee, all right? Because it is based on the fair market value. So you could have locked in the interest, the initial fee, the mortgage insurance premium was 6,000 bucks, even if you never borrowed against the loan, it just sat there. And the interesting thing about the non-borrowed portion of the line of credit is it grows with a rate that you're essentially would be paying to the bank. It will say five and a half percent. So that growth is growing uh, similar to what the debt would grow to as well. And so that's a freaking smoking deal in my opinion. Now it's costing you, I guarantee it does. Uh, but you, instead of paying $6,000 as a mortgage insurance premium, you're saying, ah, nah, I'll do it later on. I might need the money. So now you're 75, you need it. It's going to cost you uh, $9,000 because it's based on the amount of the fair market value. And on top of that, oh, whoa, come here. All right. All right. If someone wants to join us, here he is. And on top of that, uh, your the line of credit of the unused portion of that reverse mortgage is growing by the rate that you're, you'd be paying the bank if you did borrow. Did I ever show you guys this with Pablo? Look at this. See that? See that scar right there? Look at this. So he somehow he got dragged or something like that. And this is just skin. And then he's got that scar right there that uh, that somebody had. Um, we don't know what happened to him, but he's got that scar. It's crazy. I don't know what someone would have done to this guy right here. Uh, the bedroom pooper. So I call him. Hey. Uh, let's see. Didn't think about the social security side, but that was a young YouTube dividend investor with only those two accounts, no tax deferred right on taxing, unrealized, unappropriated gains has to be unconstitutional. See, that's the thing though, Mike, with the Republicans, they rely on the freaking Supreme court, uh, to bat down stuff that's inherently evil. 
Um, and it, they never, it, I mean, that's just the Republic. This is why I posted some earlier today that conservatism is progressive, uh, progressivism on, uh, going the speed, speed limit. And when I say conservatism, I really mean Republicanism, the Republicans, you know, with the large, the, uh, uh, capped R, you see what I'm saying? Not lower, higher, uppercase. And I come, I and I actually 100% agree with that without question because conservatives have said, "No, oh, we don't want to get in between this and that. We're too scared. We're scared of our shadows. We'll let the Supreme Court." And I sit there. What, you're relying on people like David Souter, who freaking you nominated, uh, Kennedy, who you nominated. Uh, who's the other? That would freaking. I still think John Roberts. I still think Obama had John Roberts some pictures of him or something like that. Why he literally rewrote the law of Obamacare and found it constitutional. Uh, it's freaking nuts. So uh, the idea that uh, something could be unconstitutional and the Supreme Court would kick it to the side. How about those Republicans? How about just get rid of it to begin with? Uh, not hold my breath. Uh, yeah, so Troy, okay, good question, Troy. So going back to that immediate annuity, he says, what if you had an emergency you needed over 5,500? That's a good question. A lot of insurance companies, man, they're uh, – I don't want to say a lot. USA, for instance, they they they're giving you an opportunity now. If you had an, a real emergency, like healthcare or something like that, uh, you could get some portion of your principal out. Um, I can't remember how they did it, but it was it was a good amount, that's for sure. You could get some portion of that principal out. Uh, it would reduce your later benefits for sure, but I, I forgot what it was. It was interesting. I know some other companies are doing that now too. If you have an emergency. Uh, you do have some principal exposure to that. I just, I don't, you'd have to research those companies for sure. And of course, if you do take it out, similar to a life insurance contract, if your point, if your, if your point is to build cash value in a life insurance contract, and then you pull it out, that just makes that life insurance contract that less solvent, if that makes sense, because there's less money in there for the interest rate to pay the insurance that the cost of insurance. And the same thing happens with an income annuity. If you were to take some of that money out because you have an emergency, inherently the remainder of that income annuity would pay you less income. I hope that makes sense. Uh, sound is fine. Sound is fine. Okay, cool. Sound is booming here, says Tim. How much of a 700K portfolio would you annuitize if you're single uh, with a 60-year-old, no heirs? Um, all right, so my man Pete says, so Pete, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, bash it around a little bit. So my man Pete says, how much would I do if I have a 700,000 portfolio of any strategy? Uh, and I'm, <laughs> who wants to take a guess what we're missing here? So he says, how much of a 700K portfolio would I annuitize if I were single with no errors? Or I, I don't even care what the strategy is, but we're missing the primo, the most important thing. Can't get any discussion without knowing this one thing. Uh, sorry, yeah, GUL, my man Harry says, GUL insurance ideas, a guaranteed UL. Um, let me just, I, I didn't mean to go on this tangent life insurance, but just while I'm yapping on it. UL, the risk is on you, all right? Whole life, the risk is on the insurance company. That's all there is to it. So if whole life, the risk is to them, they're gonna give you less interest. No other way around that. UL, the risk is on you, all right? So that means they can give you more interest because you're taking the risk. There's something called guaranteed universal life where they're saying, look, essentially it's a cash value term almost where they're saying, we're going to give you a little bit of cash value. It's not going to be much. It won't even be anywhere near universe, uh, whole life, but it will be some. And so you'll have some cash value, probably enough to get your premiums back later on down the road if you decide to cancel the contract, but it will be guaranteed to pay out at your death. Uh, John Hancock, I don't know if they still do this, but they used to do these at the uh, Survivor Life, Universal Life Insurance Policies, with Survivor Guaranteed Universal Life Insurance Policies, which I'm a huge fan of. Now, people say, but it doesn't have that much cash value. The point about second to die or Survivor Life Insurance Policies is not the flipping cash value. The point is to make sure that when you and your spouse, Josh and Charlotte, die, that Pablo and my other four kids have money. I don't care about the cash value. I want to make sure that policy is there when we die. And so USA, for example, had a huge uh, uh, cash value builds up, builds up while you were young, but it was horrible for debt. It was not good for estate planning because there was no guaranteed death benefit. And what happened was as a cost of insurance, it just began to skyrocket the older you got. So the older you got, the more the cost of insurance was, which meant the less cash value you had in there. 
is not good for estate planning. Estate planning, the only thing that matters is the, is the death benefit. You don't care about the cash value. I don't care when someone says, look at this cash value. It's going to be a million, billion bucks. It's like, what's the risk of it not paying out when I die? Well, if the interest rates go from you know four to three, eh, it's a pretty big risk. I don't, don't give it to me. If I'm using life insurance for estate planning, I want to make sure that life insurance pays out at my death. That's all there is to it. If it doesn't pay out at my death and I'm using it for estate planning, I'm not doing it. Uh, yeah, I just did a, uh, I just did a thing on a negative interest race, a dog, and my boy, a dog and a boy. Uh, so I, I don't know, you might not have seen that, but this will be in the, uh, I'll put this as a link later on. So definitely, uh, definitely see that. All right. Hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. You got Pete. Uh, can I, junk money says, can I expand on figuring inflation in my, maybe that's why my shoulder hurts because old Pablo, uh, let's see, can I expand on figuring inflation in my earnings on the front end versus figuring on the back end? Example, 5% gains less 3% equals, then you can use, uh, I don't get it, man. Uh, can I, Yeah, I'm sorry, jump. I'm not following what you're saying. Uh, IUL, Index Universal Life, is great for peace of mind near retirement, but extremely huge compounded opportunity costs for the premiums and sub Could I could never, uh, uh, I don't, could not agree that more, Magic, to you. Uh, so Magic says in his or her research, Index Universal Life is great for peace of mind near retirement, but extremely huge opportunity costs from the premiums that you're losing. Uh, the premiums that you're paying and siphon dividends plus the cap rates and participation rates. I, I'm just, I'm just not a fan of index universal life. I'm not. Uh, when you get past 50 term is absolutely expensive without question, man, because the, all your cost of insurance, you're more likely to die. And that's all that's, I mean, literally that's why uh, term is good when you're young It's freaking cheap the term is horrible as you get beyond 40 or 50 hell never mind 60. But if you need life insurance, Second die life insurance is actually cheaper too than because it covers two lives. So Josh dies, it doesn't pay out, right? So it only pays out at the death of the survivor, which means it's more likely to get more premiums from the insurance uh, from the insured, i.e., Charlotte and Josh. Uh, Eleven year tangents, rolling my eyes as I check my USAA Universal Life Insurance. Yeah, uh, Miss Constitutionalist, check that. I'm telling you, and you want to get an in force illustration. You call them up and you say, I need an in-force illustration. And then you have them walk you through what the hell it means. Um, I, I had a guy and a lady here in Georgia, nicest people in the world. And they sent me this freaking in-force illustration. They scanned it. It's like this. And I couldn't, I, I mean, I had a gauge of what it looked like, but I said, I can't figure this out. And they were fine with that. I said, you guys got to call your, your, your agent and say, tell me what the hell this is. It was nuts. I said, all I want to know is what's the likelihood of this policy going to put under current rates and current cost of living and current uh, current cost of insurance. And I mean, that's that's it. And if the rates go down, what happens then? If the rates go up, what happens then? And there's like, it was crazy. I said, this thing is nuts. So if you have a cash value life insurance or a per permanent life insurance of any kind, whole life or universal life, even as variable universal life, index universal life, I don't care. Guaranteed universe life. You absolutely want to get an in force illustration every three to five years. An in force, I N, like force, like the force be with you. An in force illustration, and uh, have them send that to you, and then have them go over it with you, so you know what the hell is going on with your life insurance. Uh, outside of high yield savings accounts or certificates of deposit, what else do I recommend? Um, I've always liked the Vanguard Ginny May Fund, V-F-I-I-X. I'm a huge fan of it. Uh, it's, I, I just, white shoes, um, you know, you and uh, uh, Flossie Carter uh, should look at V-F-I-I-X, the Vanguard Ginny May Fund, as a government national mortgage association. As when I took out my VA loan through Navy Federal Credit Union to buy this house, the Ginny May guaranteed a VA, uh, guaranteed my loan. Uh, through the Veterans Administration to Navy Federal. And uh, that's just a fact. So the Government National Mortgage Association is explicitly a federal entity. The bonds are 100% guaranteed by the federal government. And we know this 
Because if you look at 2008, the bonds of the of Government National Mortgage Association, the Ginnie Mae, went up, went up nicely. I think the USA fund was up seven and a half and the Vanguard was up seven. I can't remember. But anyway, they both went up nicely. The bonds of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac went kaput. And they should have gone to zero, but they went kaput. And they corporate bonds got hammered too. So Ginnie Mae did well in, 19, in 2008 when the only thing that did well then I think gold did, did gold do okay, but uh, certainly is government debt. Everything else got just splattered. Uh, you need to do something for your 25,000 YouTube subscriber level, a book giveaway raffle or something. I'm getting close. My, my, my man, Vic G is telling me how to give away the store. Damn, Vic. Next thing you know, Vic saying, give a thousand dollars to each of your 25,000 subscribers. <laughs> I'm just joking, brother. Um, uh, yeah, 25,000. I think I'm at like 24,100, but who's counting? It's, uh, it's close. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I got to think on that, man. It's, uh, you know, it's interesting. There's a, a guy out there. I follow uh, Jeff Rose, the wealth hacker. And I'm a fan of Jeff. Um, his YouTube channel is, is not is, is a different audience, but he's got like 250,000 followers, but he doesn't get even anywhere near the views I get, which is odd to me because, you think if you got that many followers, subscribers, you, you'd be, you know, you'd be pretty wealthy. I like, man, Grant Steven, but Jeff isn't, it's just odd. So the people who are here are loyal and I, uh, I freaking love it. And I think one of the reasons, well, I don't know why the reasons are. Um, it's certainly not because my fancy schmancy suit and tie, like I did when I first started the channel. It's certainly not because my great lighting, even though I did get some new lights here and hopefully that's, they're looking a little bit better. Um, but uh, maybe it's just, I don't know. Um, I don't know, but it's freaking awesome. Right on, Jody. Uh, James, right on. Late to the party. Uh oh, what time? Wait, hold on a second. There's a, ooh, the Patriots. I'm staying on there. Don't you worry, my friends. Well, let's just take a quick sports to highlight here to see how bad the Patriots are losing. I already told my son 24 13 Baltimore. I guarantee that's going to be the score. You heard it here first. The Pats are going to lose. How do we know that? Because we know. If, uh, if I want them to win, you know they'll lose. And, of course, will I watch that game? No. Are you crazy? I'm not watching that game. It's already 7 nothing. Baltimore. Baltimore's got the ball. Only a matter of time for the Pats to lose. All right. Uh, Jay says, if I move funds from a 401K to a Roth and pay the taxes, that would increase your income and also increase your Social Security benefits would that increase your income and also increase your so no okay so uh the question is if i move my funds from a 401k to a roth to do a for a roth conversion i have to pay tax on that money which to do that will that also increase my social security benefits the answer is no because that is not subject to fica so you're not paying uh you know, your social security tax is 6.2 percent that's only on earned income and you, that what you're doing there's not earned income so uh so good question jay um, MDF says friend is 54 retiring. So 60, 600 K in stocks because RIA told her risk of triple B and double C debt risk, inflating stocks and low yields. Uh, oh boy. Uh, 3% S and P 500. She moved all money to, uh, close end funds and, uh, I forgot business development corporations that pay 11% monthly. Dividends, 5K a month, good strategy. I did a video on the business development companies uh, a month or so ago. I just looked at one or two, and I, they actually looked okay. I, I was I was pleasantly surprised, frankly. Um, I I I just think that's freaking nuts, uh, MD. I <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> oh my goodness, the debt ratings on junk bonds are inflating the stocks. I just, uh, and she's an RIA and she's moving to close end funds. Um, I, uh, and business development companies, I flip and guarantee you she's getting commissions there. And so she's going to say she's fee based as opposed to fee only in the intuition or the insinuation that she's fee only. I guarantee no one is going to put you in a BDC if they're not, unless they're getting commissions. It's just that, uh, that I, I, man, I'm beginning to really despise this business. I really am. I, I find that to be, uh, 
I, I don't know what else to say. I, I would, I'd have your friend say, Hey, how much did you get paid for that? Um, no one who's getting paid a fee is going to put their freaking clients into BDCs. And they're going to do it because they're getting commissions. And I, I assure you the commissions aren't low. And I, look, I'm not an anti-commission guy, not in the least, not. I always tout American funds with Ed Jones over some RIA charging one and a quarter, 100%. Ah, oh, that just infuriates me. It, 54 years old, man. I'm nuts. All right, whatever. I just, uh, um, how would I invest a 1.1 million all in at or cost or just a dollar cost average in? Jody T, man, I, I I don't know. I mean, I, for me, I'd put it all in, but it's that's theoretical for me. I mean, if it's you, it's not theoretical. So the reality would be is instead of dumping it all in and you're going into a 2000 October 2007 buzzsaw, you know, it's probably advisable to do a hundred thousand bucks a month for the next uh, you know 12 months for sure. Um, you know, just to make sure that you don't get killed right on the front end, that's for sure. But yeah, at the end of the day, I, I look, I just, I believe in the market. It, it really comes down to the income needs. I mean, I, it, it always comes down to this. So let's just say you have enough money from your work and you have enough money from, let's say, Social Security or a pension that you don't need the money from your stocks or your income or your investments. Then just dump it all in there and be done with it. If, if you know, obviously, I don't know your circumstance. I don't know if you're going to keel over tomorrow. I don't know if you got a wife, a, a husband. I don't know if you got Pablo who's pooping in your bedroom. I don't know anything about you. But the ideal position would be, I don't need this money. This is the equivalent of FU money to the market. Take that, Mark, Mr. Market. As who said that? Was that Ben Graham? Someone said Mr. Market. Anyway, I, th I think it was Ben Graham. But anyway, you say FU Ben Market or Mr. Market. I don't need your money anyway. I got Social Security. I got pension. I got this. I got that. Or I'm working. Dump it in there. Be done with it. If you need the money to live on, yeah, it's a whole different st story, though, for sure. My man Bruce says uh, he's Pablo's due sign agent. <laughs> We should talk about the Pablo Josh show as well as upgrading treats with no more food with carrots. 100% Bruce. Oh man, that guy's just snuggling over there. Shh, he's so cute. Don't tell anybody, but he's just, that's why I call him cat dog. Cause he's literally rolled up like a cat and he's got his, uh, his chew toy in his mouth. And then he like purrs when he's sitting on my lap, but it's like a growl purr. So he's like half cat, half dog, half kid. Uh, Right on fear. Fear of the turtle says moving money to a Roth will not increase Social Security. Uh, Anthony Gloria, never seen this guy before. Is Vanguard the best company to get a Roth with? I hate to say the best or anything, but uh, I want to go. I had a guy I was working with the other day who had some Vanguard stuff. Um, and we were talking about the difference between his Schwab advisor and Vanguard. And uh, so, Anthony, I, I like Vanguard. If you're self-directing, I got no qualm with Vanguard at whatsoever. I'm actually in the process of setting up an interview with a guy or lady from M1 Finance, by the way. That should be pretty interesting. Um, make sure I'm still – one sec. Oops. Oops. Oh, I just lost myself. Um, anyway, so this guy uh, – what was I saying? So I was surprised how, how um, much more involved Schwab was in Vanguard. Now, Schwab charged a lot more. I think it was 75 basis points. Uh, Vanguard is what, 30 basis, something like that, 35. But Vanguard doesn't do much. I just like, I, I got friends work there. I talk about Vanguard a lot. I think Vanguard can play a role for somebody if you're going to use their personal advisory services. But by and large, if you're just going to do it on your own, just go Vanguard, be done with it. That's, I got no qualm with that at all. Uh, right on, Pete. <laughs> Mike says, Pablo, uh, bark once if interest rates are going down twice. If, or wait, wait, Pablo, bark once if interest rates are going up twice if they're going down. <laughs> now, that is funny. I say, Pablo, don't bark at all if you have no idea. <laughs> Any thoughts on a good way to help my 10-year-old grandson learn about investing? I want to start an account for him. Hmm. Um, I would, well, I always like the idea of buying something from the mint. You know what I'm saying? Um, I don't think I have my little gold things. It's not the cheapest way to do it, but 
I don't know that I don't know if it's my granddad or something like that, but I've always I've always been interested in collecting stuff. You know, the mint baseball cards. Every I went to Georgia Tech game the other day. Uh, Cavan and I uh, yesterday in Georgia Tech might be one of the worst college football teams in history. And uh, you know, I got there. Um, let me show you. And there's us at the game. There's a game right there. We got good seats, and there we are. It's my boy at the game. And so we went to the game yesterday and uh, got, I always get a program. I, I think that stuff is cool. Uh, what I like about the mint is it, it's, it's something a kid can hold in his hand. And I, I just find that to be uh, a stock is an intangible asset. I, I get all these people say, my dad told me about the stock charts and stuff. And, you know, I, I, I don't know that, that may or may not work for me. I don't know, but I, I get that a lot. You know, I saw a stock chart and I said, Oh, if I own this or I got a, one share of Disney, people do that. get a, stock certificate of disney i actually like the gold but kids understand gold they get gold they get silver i just for me that's what i do dan i'd say man spend you know whatever what's a an ounce trading at 1300 now something like that you know, give them spend two thousand bucks or three thousand bucks on a couple of gold coins things like that and show them how to look it up there's something tangible about owning that in your hand and seeing the value change and then as he gets interested you might say, you know, you can even do more. I can, you know, we can show you what a stock would be or something like that. But gold, kids, even, even kids understand gold. Uh, uh, David says dollar cost averaging is when you're in investing or receiving uh, your investment income over time, not when you get a lump sum. Well, I mean, your dollar cost averaging into the market for sure. Uh, Who's the person that gives a thumb down? I got some liberals on here, Tim. Some don't like me. I got my man, Bob, who's my troll. Every time I do a video, he gives me a thumbs down and, and talk smack, which is good because it helps with the algorithm. I got no qualm with that. More power to him. The thumbs down is actually good. As long as I have more thumbs up than thumbs down, I got no qualm with that. Uh, the good up on the guy. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, Jody says Vanguard did a study. The results were more positive when you put the entire 1.1 in to make it work at once. Yeah, they were. Other than the times you put the 1.1 million in in 2000 in uh, October 2007. So uh, yes, on, you know, in hindsight, <laughs> uh, it's more favorable and more likely to proceed that you make more money by dumping it all in at once. Uh, but you know, 1973. Uh, 2000, uh, 2007, you know, it's just, it's, uh, are you going to be able to sleep at night if you dumped up 1.1 million all at once? I mean, look, I can sit here theoretically and say, just do it. I'd have a hard, hell, I was having a hard time. My freaking, you know, a 10th of that, you know, the money I'd left over from my 401k was 150,000 bucks. I was like, all right, just invest it. And I just, I kept saying, ah, wait, wait. And I said, finally, just said, freaking do it. And you know, it took me like three months to finally do it. Cause I was like, ah, what if I don't make any money in my business and I need that money? And that's the difference between not needing the money and needing the money. When I needed the money, I was worried that if I had a 30% decline, my 150,000 bucks would go down to, uh, I don't know, 100,000 bucks, whatever it was. And that'd be, you know, I, I mean, that's 50,000 bucks gone that I don't have for my mortgage to put to do food on the table. And stuff like that and then when if you don't need the money for an income stream uh you're more, more blase about it so it's really just about our income all right uh so david said if you get a lump sum how do you decide how to dollar cost average that any schedule would be arbitrary then if the market goes up while well, you've decided to divide your lump sum yeah, yeah I, I, <laughs> I don't think that's the that's, Yes, uh, any uh, amount would be arbitrary uh, for sure, uh, but everything's arbitrary. It's arbitrary to, to put it in yes uh, tomorrow as opposed to wait until Friday. Everything's arbitrary. I, I don't care. See, this is the drawback I think people follow. They fall for the efficiency, the efficient market theory, uh, efficient market hypothesis, uh, the modern portfolio theory and all this, as if there's some scientific way that this can all work or the evidence-based investing that dimensional fund advisors and their plethora of uh, advisors follow evidence-based investing there's some like rationale behind this the rationale is are you gonna be able to sleep at night that's the most important rationale are you gonna run out of money or are you gonna be able to sleep at night and the one number one thing is are you gonna be able to sleep at night if for me i'm not gonna be able to sleep at night if i'm invested in a market and i need that money to pay the bills 
it'll be a hell of a lot easier to sleep at night if I don't need that money to pay the bills. So if I don't need that money to pay the bills, I'd be more inclined to dump the whole thing in. If I need that money to pay the bills, I'd be less inclined. Uh, so I'm going to dollar cost average in an arbitrary way. Nothing wrong with that, man. Being arbitrary about your money that lets you rest your head on the pillow and sleep like a teddy bear or my man over here, Poop and Pablo, is okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, good man. Fear the turtle, man. That's right on, brother. Fear the turtle says if you have an amount such as 1.1 million, investing it all will allow you to enter some fun family like American funds and pay uh, only 12B1 fees in the future, which runs about, uh, I don't think it's 0.3%. I think it's 25 basis points. Maybe that's what you're saying. But yeah, that's uh, that man. That's I. Man, that is, you could buy American funds at NAV. That means no commissions, no sales charge whatsoever. You're getting, you know, the income fund of America, one of my favorite funds of all time. Capital World, Capital World Growth and Income Fund, CWGIX. Freaking some of the best ass kicking funds out there for no commissions at all, just on NAV. And you're paying, I guess, the expense ratio on them is like 40 bips, and you're paying 25 bips for the uh, the 12B1. So all in is 65 basis points on, on some of the best run, more conservative funds that are out there by far. I, I, that's a good point for you. I, I'm a huge fan of American funds. If you can get American funds with no commissions, that, that's, uh, man, that, that's, that's tough to overlook. Hey, thanks, Rebecca. No, you didn't say last week. Who did say? I love that you're an old metalhead from the 80s. I am as well. Pete Stone, man. Oh. Who's my favorite? Slayer. There's no other way around that. Slayer. Love Slayer. I mean, they're silly, but I love them. Um, Dave Lombardo. That, oh, my goodness. So I've, I've went to many hardcore shows up and in, up in, from Boston down to D.C., and I've gone to metalhead shows. I've always kept my hair short. Uh, hardcore shows are freaking just violent as could be. They're fun, but man, metal shows where you literally got and those metal heads were insane. You go into a, a go see Slayer, and you you uh, it was nuts. You go to a hardcore show, it was fun, violent, and the Slayer though was oh my goodness, I, I, who did I see? I think it was like White Zombie. I think I saw White Zombie up in Baltimore back in like 1989. Man, that was insane. I mean, I just these big freaking country redneck metalheads with a freaking huge long hair and i was like holy crap you go to hardcore show was more skinny kids you know from uh i don't know from from college but man oh i never liked the uh i never liked the the metal rah, the cookie monster voice i never liked that that's why metal where they that death metal um brrr, that that never did anything for me all right so jerry's gotta go back to worth see ya uh, I'm enjoying the right cap, but I think I'm getting the hang of it. Right on, Kerry. Uh, it certainly matters where you live in Boise. Housing rising 17% a year. Yeah, because all those California people, man. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, right. Yeah, I'll put some. I'm, I'm probably not going to do any right cap on this. Well, let's, what time's our, what time, how long have we been on this guy here? It's the 850. So we've been on it for uh, over an hour and 20 minutes. So I probably won't do any right. Well, we'll see. Uh, Yep, misconstitutionalist. There, that's what I'm saying. Republicanism and not conservatism is a progressive progressivism uh, going the speed limit. Uh, let's see. I have a couple of things that haven't worked out. My conversions are within four or three, not two IRA. I haven't figured out how to account for the housing allowance. Okay. Uh, hey, big A, what's going on? I think an immediate annuity. Uh, One second, I missed something. I think in a, uh, Peter says I think an immediate annuity can give you peace of mind if you have enough cash of it. I one I man one hundred percent agree with that Peter. An immediate annuity can give you peace of mind if you have enough cash available to handle emergencies. I I one hundred percent agree with that. But as you know, uh, I would say you need some stocks to get the growth potential that stocks can give. Immediate annuities, cash. Reverse mortgage, stocks, all those things should be open for discussion for sure. Um, Prairie Mark says, if you buy a SPIA, should you look at a higher rated insurance company with a lower interest rate 
or a lower rated insurance company with a higher interest rates and rely on state insurance to pay off if insurance companies defaults. Um, I would be on a higher rated insurance company without question, without question. Expenses versus overall income. Yeah, man. Do I think Pelosi and Schiff have anything on the Trumps or absolutely not? Nope. They don't. They're, I mean, look, they know what they're doing. They're, they're playing this out. And I, look, I think it's good. I keep, I, I, I think they're idiots to do this. I mean, we saw what happened with Republicans and Clinton. And Trump didn't do anything like what Clinton did, but we saw it helped Clinton, man, in 2000, uh, 1998. The whole stuff around impeachment helped Clinton. And Republicans thought for sure they'd win. Uh-uh. And the same thing is going to help Trump because it's going to get his base fired up, man. I'm not that they weren't fired up en- enough, but what happens is in these off year elections, the base settles down because they're now in charge and the outside party gets fired up. And then in the reelection thing, it's really just based on the economy. And if the Democrats are spending all this time talking about impeachment, uh, I, I, I just I, I think it's stupid politically because people are like, all right, well, either do it or don't. One of the two things. But if you're not going to impeach him, let's talk about the things that matter, i.e. the economy. And if they don't talk about impeachment, they I think they have I, I think health care other than Warren's stupid idea. I think the Democrats have this freaking hole the size of uh, of Christian McCaffrey running th- for his 58 yard touchdown today, but they don't want to take it because they're going to be focused on impeachment. I think it's great because I know Republicans are too squishy other than Trump to talk about health care. I get it. But the Democrats have this whole wide open. All they got to do is take it and not say we're going to give it to legal immigrants and not say we're going to tax your unrealized gains. And they get, they, they would take that without question. Uh, but they're, they're too focused on solidifying their base on a patient, which is not, uh, look, the, I see, I don't even read the Drudge Report, but the idea that there's people that want Trump impeached and removed is silly. So we know that Trump, if he, if they run on impeachment, it's just going to help Trump. And yet that would, if they were smart, they'd say, look, we did it. We would impeach him or not. I don't care. But let's focus on healthcare and making it a Medicare for all, but we're not going to show, share with you how you're funded. That's a winner. It's stupid, but it's a winner because people don't want to know how this stuff is funded. They just want it now. And, and the Republicans have no retort to that because Republicans are spineless other than Trump. Uh, yeah, right on, Prairie Mark. You bought a median annuity and it helped relax. Exactly. That's the whole point about retirement, the efficiency stuff and the all this stuff about we got to do this because, you know, all these scientists and professors say that. Well, actually, the professors say media annuities, but all the financial advisors say like freaking David Stewart that he says, you know, by dollar cost averaging, you're missing out on upside growth. You might not be. <laughs> you just you can't say that. We don't know if you're going to miss out on growth because we don't know. But we do know if you're putting all that money into the market at once, there is a risk that you're going to get crushed. We know that for a fact, all right? And if you get crushed, that's going to suck. And if you're worried about getting crushed, that's going to have a hard time sleeping at night. And if you can buy an immediate annuity or dollar cost average to put your to make you rest easier, that, that just makes sense to me. Yeah, Vanessa says she has only annuity, mostly annuity is the only way to go. I got, man, no problem with that at all. Uh, Tim says, send me my $1,000 now because of 25,000 subscribers. I see it says 24K there, brother. So you're going to have to wait. And I'll send you a check, courtesy of Nancy Pelosi, all right? Uh, pension and part-time incomes greater than overall expenses, quality of life and freedom. I could not agree. Uh, V-I-G. Which one is a V-I-G? All right, let's take a look. It sounds like a Vanguard one, so I probably am a fan of that. Oops. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's dividend appreciation ETF. Absolutely, Mark. Mark says, I'm a fan of the Vanguard uh, dividend appreciation VIG. The answer is yes. I'm more of a fan of the VDIGX, the Vanguard dividend uh, growth mutual fund, but uh, I, I like them both. And I think I did a video comparing them to, and I think I like VDIGX a little bit more. Seven zip now. Yeah. Uh, love it when the Pats lose, says Dan Young's. That's great, Dan. Thanks, man. You have to ban you. 10 nothing Baltimore. They still got the ball. Uh, I'd love you to watch the latest f- form of fist YouTube on housing market. Mirror image happening in the housing market now as happened in 2008. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, all housing market is local. That's a fact, Vanessa. Sky, I completely agree. 
Uh, Jude Whitman said, uh, that's Slim Mittens, Whitman's daughter, or son, I should say, daughter or son. Uh, in Seattle, the sky is falling. Is that because the socialists have taken over or because the real estate market got crunched like what happened in Vancouver? Uh, All right, I missed your answer about how much to annuitize on a 700K portfolio. Uh, you mentioned there's one important consideration then moved on to a different question, uh, says Eisman 57. It's expenses, uh, man, if I don't know expenses, you, I just, I, if I can, if I die tonight because all the CO2 I'm breathing out here, um, you know, CO2 is so evil, it's so evil and it kills me. Um, just remember, you cannot do a financial plan of any sort until you know how much money you need. It's just all there is to it. So to say how much should I annuitize on a 700,000 portfolio, I man, I got no idea, none whatsoever. It'd be like saying, how should I invest my 1.1 million? I got no idea at all. You cannot do, um, it just you can't do any kind of projection, modeling, uh, planning, unless you know expenses. I just cannot stress this enough. I, please folks recognize that because it's, uh, it's, it's so critical. Wisconsin's slow decline in housing now, mid-America's fine. Oh boy, something is brewing. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, not here in Georgia. I'm telling you, man, down here, hell, I was driving around the other day. It was freaking built. I mean, it's from Atlanta up uh, with For Forsyth County uh, today, taking my son to play tennis this morning. Um, I just from Forsyth County down to Midtown, um, downtown, this freaking, this whole corridor is, there's cranes everywhere. Now, some might say that's a bubble. I don't think so. I think that cranes are from people saying, I'm getting the hell out of Connecticut and New York like a Trumpster, and I'm moving south. It's freaking nuts here. I, I, it's insane. I, I just, you sit there and you're like, it's, uh, <laughs> it might be a bubble. It might be a bubble. I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, yeah. Oh, Vanessa, New York is a big trouble uh, and higher end home costs. I, man, that's funny. I had a guy a long time ago who was outside of Binghamton someplace. I forgot where. And he was like a doctor and he had a big house and the nicest guy ever, but he couldn't sell it to save his life because no doctors were moving in. No people who could afford him, his home was moving in. It was nuts. That was like freaking I don't know, eight, nine, 10 years ago or something like that. I bet he has, still hasn't sold that house. Um, sad. Are you in the real estate business, Vanessa? Because uh, you talk, I mean, it seems like you might have some knowledge out there. Uh, Jude just got out in time in Seattle. Yeah, right on. Pablo needs a litter box. Maybe he thinks he's a cat. <laughs> <laughs> he's such a, I love that guy. Every mark is local. Even dead dog, man. Texas, Texas retirees. Uh, you like that, Carl? Pablo pooping in my bedroom. Yeah, it makes you laugh, huh? Yeah, great, great. Uh, <laughs> PMs, wealth you can hold. Hey, Lind Lydia Santia Santiago. Hey, what's going on, Lydia? PMs, wealth you can hold. I'm not sure what a PM is. Private mortgage? I'm a hardcore conservative, and given the choice between single parent and Obamacare, I'll go with ACA. It forces every. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I, I would just want vouchers, just like Medicare Advantage. Give me vouchers. Give me vouchers or give me death. Uh, oh. Hold on a second. All right. Uh, gold is a cool idea. I think I want him to learn about the stock market. Yeah, well, there you go. Match him one for one. I like it. Uh, reminds me of that movie, What About Bob? We know what happened. He turned to a YouTube troll. <laughs> Less debt makes you sleep better at night. I tell you, brother, that is no doubt, Tim. I mean, having... Being able to pay off uh, the the debt I had, other than this mortgage, it, it's a big deal, uh, and I still got a mortgage. It's a big fat mortgage. The sort of the Damoclus, Damoc, whatever the hell you say that, Damoclus, D A M O C L E S. You know what I'm talking about? That's why I got hanging over my head. Just a horse hair is holding that up, and when that horse hair breaks because of uh, Elizabeth Warren, that sucker is going to slice me in half. There'll be no more YouTube channel, and then Pablo will just lick up my intestines that are laying on the ground it's gonna be nuts i, I oh, it scares me to death and i just say man but i've had other debt that i've been able to pay off because i've been i mean i'm nuts how successful this channel has allowed me to become it's uh it's great i'm not making a million bucks i'm not saying anything like that but uh 
I've been able to pay a lot of debt off uh, that I had. And look, when I say a lot, I'm not, I wasn't freaking, you know, you know, living paycheck to paycheck, that kind of thing. But, you know, when I started my business, I took on some debt, took out money from my 401k in order to pay the bills for a while. And that was kind of dicey. And then you're sitting there thinking, oh, but not having these uh, sorts of debt that I took on to start the business is, is freaking, it's relieving like I can't stress. Uh, Vanessa's great channel. I don't have as much as most of you, but I learned from you. So thank you. Good night. I, I don't know how Vanessa thinks she has a lot, but okay, you know, right on. Anyone is in, interested in learning about Forex markets as Christian V, let them know. Raining Blood is the heaviest song ever. That's not up for debate. Now nah, there's a band called The Sword I've come across about 10 years ago. Their new stuff is just bad, but bad because it's more like 80s, eh, almost eh, kind of popish metal, which I can't stand. But man, The Sword, uh, just while I'm thinking about my friends, if you guys are liking music, I'm just going to bring it up. If you want to hear some, hold on just a second, if I can find it. These guys, I think, are from Texas. Don't, uh, oops, hold on just a sec. The sword. Oops, the sword. Yeah, right, Age of Winners, that's what it's called. Yeah, right there, the Age of Winners, the sword Age of Winners. Oh, man, that's a freaking, that's a great album. Uh, that's a great album. That every single song in Age of Winners is awesome. Uh, uh, my man Prairie Mark said an anti annuity mentality for his whole life. Yeah, no, a lot of people do Prairie Mark, and that's uh, that's not good. You should be open to anything. Just because some people say don't do it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. I mean, why? Why? I want to know why. Why? Uh, he bought a SPF. He sold off his clothes and funds. Yeah, right on, man. Can oh, Rob, oops, where was he? Can you explain the difference between mutual funds and ETFs? When do you invest in one or the other? Well, uh, until I found M1, which you can invest regularly into ETFs, I would say if you're going to do dollar cost averaging, you should do it to mutual funds because you don't have a, a trade. An ETF trade is just like a stock, Rob. All right. So you can buy and sell. You can, I mean, you can, I imagine you can even leverage. You could, I don't know, I bet you could probably sell options against it. Uh, an ETF is literally a stock, but it owns a basket of different investments in there. It could be bonds too, by the way, but it owns a basket of you know, stocks. So you have ETFs on the S&P 500, you have ETFs on small cap, you got ETFs on all kinds of different things. So an ETF is a conglomerate of individual positions that are put together to trade every second of every day like an individual stock. And what an individual stock means is very liquid. As long as there's volume, as long as you get a seller when you're on your uh, buyer on when you're trying to sell it, but you can buy and sell it you know, all throughout the day, which is uh, which John Bogle hated, by the way. He said he created traders. He wasn't a big fan of traders. He was a fan of investors, as am I. But every time you're buying and selling an ETF, there's a trade, there's a transaction cost. With a mutual fund, there isn't. A mutual fund uh, is the same scenario. It owns a basket of other holdings. Uh, but it trades once a day. That's it. It trades at 405, essentially, at the end of the market. It'll, it'll price all the different things it owns in there. And it has one day NAV, net asset value. So at 405, you'll know the NAV, 405 Eastern time, of the mutual fund that you have. And you'll know the price if you're trying to buy it that day. And you'll know the price if you're trying to sell it that day. You'll only know it that one time. Uh, but most mutual funds are open-ended, which they just trade and they trade and trade. So you, you keep investing and keep investing and keep investing. And there's no transaction costs for the vast majority of Vanguard, for instance. You just buy, buy, buy. No transaction costs because they'll take as much money as they feel they can handle uh, until they feel they get too big, like Prime Cap or the Dividend and Growth Fund. But they say, we got to shut this down. We got too much money. So you can say, I'm sending $250 a month uh, to Vanguard Dividend and Growth Fund. It doesn't cost you anything. You don't know what your price will be. Uh, but that's okay because you say, I don't care. I'm just sending it, I'm sending it, sending it. But if you're doing that ETF, each time you're sending that 250 bucks a month, there's going to be a transaction cost of whatever the, you know, the price of a commission is. And you still, someone's got to actually make an actual trade. That would be you. You'd actually go in there and make the trade. So M1 Finance, and I, I don't know other firms that do this. I don't know. Uh, they say, we can do that all that for you. And uh, we're not going to charge anything. I'm sure they get paid somehow. How, you know, if I interview them, I'll ask them. Uh, cause they get paid sure, certainly, but they don't, uh, you know, they just say, we'll, we'll put you in the ETFs. It won't be any transaction costs. 
Now you can't, I don't know if you can sell throughout. I don't know. I, I frankly don't care, but that's the difference. So it used to be, I said, nah, man, just go to Vanguard, dollar cost average, 250 bucks a month into the S&P 500 and be done with it. But now I have my dollar cost averaging goes to M1 Finance. So I think I invest 350 bucks a month in there. I started with a thousand dollars. I put 350 bucks a month. I've only been doing that for a few months, but, uh, but there's no transaction cost. So that's, that, that was the difference between the two. A mutual fund had no transaction cost essentially to buy and sell where, where ETF did. I hope that makes sense. Uh, individual dividend stocks, a good idea outside of retirement plan, says Linda. And how much to have in that account will make it worthwhile at retirement? Uh, individual dividend stocks certainly are a good uh, idea outside of retirement plan. How much to have in it to make it worthwhile at a retirement? You know, freaking a billion, billion dollar. I don't know, Linda. I mean, I, as much as you possibly can, for sure. I like dividend stocks inside of Roth, frankly. I like growth stocks outside my retirement plan. I'd much rather have dividend stocks inside of Roth growth stocks outside of Roth or growth stocks inside a, a taxable account outside a retirement plan. And the reason for that is a couple of things. Uh, qualified dividends, while they're tax uh, friendly, are still taxable income if you're in the above a 12% tax bracket. All right. So qualified dividends are tax preferable, but they're still taxable as income. Growth stocks generally don't have dividends. They, they generally don't yield dividends. So growth stocks will be dividend free which means there's no taxable income to you, all right? Now, anything you pull out of a Roth is tax-free. So your gross stocks are tax-free because they don't usually pay a dividend. And that your accounts that your, your money you're pulling from your dividend stocks inside, outside, in your Roth, I should say, come out tax-free as well. But there's a second thing on this. Grow, uh, anything outside an IRA grows and grows and grows. And at your death, that transfers to your heirs tax-free because what's called a step-up in basis. All right, same thing happens with a Roth now. So Roth grows tax-free, tracks tax-free, tax-free. It transfers outside uh, to your heirs tax-free, but so doesn't a taxable account. So the taxable account, we want to make it as aggressive as possible without paying any dividends and ideally without much in terms of capital gains and just let that sucker go, 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 go. So that way you don't have any capital gains, no dividends, no income. And at your death, your heirs will receive that property tax-free. And then on top of that, you couple that with your Roth IRA. Generally speaking, the dividends will be a little bit of a headwind on the growth potential of stocks. Not all the time, but generally speaking. So your Roth might not grow as much, but they still grow both tax-free. So I'm a fan of dividends inside of Roth, and I'm a fan of growth stocks outside of Roth, if that makes sense. Yeah, Binghamton's dead, yeah. Uh, Mike C says, all cash, okay. You got it. Thanks, Rob. I don't care what they say. You're a good man, except for the Steelers. Sword of Damocles. Uh, SWFL, real estate building and selling. SWFL sounds like a football league. Yeah, I, I'm not a big fan of individual stocks either, Tim. PM is precious metals. Did not know that. Oh, thanks. S uh, HSC. Otherwise known as Mom says you're so great and you deserve your YouTube success, man. Thanks, appreciate that. That's uh, that's good. Um, what is this, oh, Marie? What is a SPIA? A single premium, immediate, or an income annuity? It's just you're turning over a certain amount of money to an insurance company, and what they're doing is they're going to grant you an income that you can't outlive. It's a uh, it's a very good, very favorable. Um, opportunity. You say, I'm going to give you a hundred thousand bucks and they're going to give you 5,500 a year or something like that. And as long as you're breathing, you, you cannot live that. The drawback about SPI is, is that, like I said, the first 20 years, you're essentially just getting your money back. So you got to survive beyond 20 years in which to make it profitable for you. But if you do, if you survive it for 30 years, you're, you're getting like a four and a half to 4.66%, depending on the rates of return, but depending on their interest, whatnot, on your on your money and guarantee as long as you survive you are making money it's in a good rate of return the longer you live the more you're going to receive because there's what's called mortality credits i'm not gonna get too deep in here today but what happens is the the longer you live the more money you get from the, the insurance company which is a 
I hate to say it, but that's you're getting that from people who died earlier, right? So I take an annuity, Marie, you take an annuity. I live 15 years. I did not receive my principal back. The insurance company doesn't get it. It pays it to you who lives 30 years, if that makes sense. The insurance company expects us both to live 18 years, all right? I die before my 18 years are up. Thus, there's an excess amount of money that goes back into the pot. You live well beyond those 18 years. That excess amount of money is a, goes into you. It's called a mortality credit. The longer you live, the greater your return will be on that income annuity. So people who are long-lived, in good shape, longevity runs in their family, and income annuity is great. If you're smoking and you're skydiving without a, um, without a freaking parachute, you're freaking drinking, and you're taking your motorcycle 100 miles an hour around the Acadia Bar Harbor thing, you, you probably don't want one because you're dead, all right? Don't do that. So if you're going to be, a, if you're going to not smoke a carton of cools a day, you're not drinking 8,000 pints of Guinness like me a day, certainly not getting behind the wheel, and you're not rooting for the Patriots, uh, you'll probably live a long time, all right? But if you don't, if you do all those things, you're probably going to die. So an income, an income annuity really should be geared towards those who are long lived because they can really make good money. I mean, you're never going to make stock like returns, but I don't know if you're ever going to make stock like returns. That's the thing. Everyone says stock market is your way to, to wealth. I, I, we don't know that. We don't know. The nice thing about a SPIA is it's 100% guaranteed. There's literally no risk to you other than you're going to run out of money because, other than the rate of inflation. Inflation is the risk because a lot of income annuities, they, they should. not You don't want to take an income annuity that just with inflation. It's way, 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 way too un, unattractive on the front end. So you're getting this fixed rate of return, but your expenses are going up with inflation. At some point, those two things are going to cross. And when they do, you're like, oh man, the, the annuity sucked. It didn't really, but still that would be the drawback. But the issue is, well, stocks have done better, thus they will do better. Well, we don't <clears throat> Carrie says, good night. La cama me llama. The bed is calling me, I think is what that says. I think that what it says. Uh, shoulders still got some issues, man. That's why I'm using this guy right here. So two pounder, I got two, three and five pounders. And it's just, but I'm able to go behind me now. And I got flexibility. And the doc, he, you put, he put some pressure on it. He said, oh man, you're doing great. I said, all right. But it's just, uh I said, when am I going to be able to get under the bar again? Because that hurts right there. And he says, eh, start with two, three, five, and it will just go up, you know, a little bit every week or so. But man, just got to stretch it. But I have this weight, uh, so not weightlifting, it's a uh, uh, massage thing. But every time I turn on old bedroom poopy over there, uh, he, he gets crazy and he starts ground and screaming because it makes his noise as his light. It like goes like this. He's like, so I can't do that with him sitting right there. Uh, yeah, Mike C said it both WorldCom. I had WorldCom too, man, in Lucent. I had that too, man. I also had uh, Junifei's JDSU. I had, um, oh, man, what's the other one I had? Ah, I forgot. Uh, Vanguard does not charge for purchasing Vanguard VTA ETFs. That was good. Did not know that. It's right on. Have I looked at uh, Vanguard Consumer Staples, Admiral? No. That sounds like it'd be a good fun. Absolutely. Haven't looked at it. No, that's, uh, that's good stuff. I'm interested in getting it out of personal capital as they charge 89 basis points. I'm not seeing much benefit in their managed portfolio theory versus Schwab uh, and whatnot. I've got approximately 1.5. Huh? That's uh, no way. Touchdown pass. Hold on a sec. All right. Yeah, but touchdown pass, but then freaking rate. See, I told you 23, what did I say? 23, 14. Uh, I, I can't help transaction that, Carl. That's, that's, I don't mess with that stuff. Sorry, brother. Um, yeah. Car, yeah, 900 bucks a month is a kill. Yeah, that's crazy. That's $12,000 a year. I, I just, I can't. I'm not your guy in that regard. Sorry. Tim, time to hit. Hey, Tina. <laughs> Tina says two more touchdown passes from Brady and her fantasy football team wins this week. The Ravens always got the Pats freaking uh, number always other than that one year where Danny Amendola was it Danny Amendola to catch it or did he pass it when he had the, uh, not the flea flicker, but Brady threw to him 
the Patriots down twice by two touchdowns. They came back to win and beat the Ravens. And I was not, I never thought I'd see that because the Ravens always got the Patriots numbers. Always, they're always all there is to it. The Ravens should have beat the Patriots when they went 18 and 0. If I'm not mistaken, the Ravens played the Patriots in week 15, and the Patriots got a couple calls that went their way that really should not have. Yeah, but the Ravens always got the Patriots number. I hate when we play them in the freaking playoffs. I hate the Ravens. I used to, I mean, I hate the Ravens. I just hate them. Can't stand them. Call them the Baltimore Browns. Southwest Florida selling Cape Coral. Uh, Southwest Florida is building and selling Cape Coral to Naples. I'm not sure I understand uh, between dividend stocks and growth stocks. How about mutual funds and index funds? Are those growth or dividend? Um, all right. So, uh, JD, uh, mutual funds and index funds can be both. I mean, they can be growth and or dividend, or they can be a company like an index 500 is going to be growth and, and dividend. Um, dividends will fall on the value side. So if I, if you look at it like this, you got growth, you got value. So the S and P 500 you're going to have growth stocks and you're going to have value stocks. Roughly 200 of the S&P 500 is grow is, is a value and 300 is growth. All right. So this just means has lower price to earnings ratios, uh, lower price to book ratios and higher dividend yields. All right. Um, and this is going to have higher PE ratios, lower, if any dividend yields, and higher if uh, price to book. And, and that's just all it means. So a dividend stock is gonna fall on the value side, which inherently means it's not growth. Now there's no, yeah, this is my wife just texted. So there's no, uh, there's no science to that. Just they're gonna look at the stocks and say, hey, what's our paying the dividends? We're gonna kind of throw those into the value side. What are not paying the dividends? We're gonna kind of throw those into the growth side. Apple pays a dividend. Is that considered a growth or a value? Is literally anyone's guess. I, I mean, I just don't know. But you know, by and large, your uh, consumer staples, as uh, someone said, pointed out before, those will be considered grow, uh, dividend uh, value stocks. You know, defensive stocks are going to be value stocks. You know, your high flyers, Amazon. Uh, you know, my, I guess Microsoft. You know, the, the tech uh, would be considered growth if that makes sense. So you can buy mutual funds or ETFs that focus on either or both at the same time. It, it's, that's all there is to it. I, I hope that helps. If you see a real estate investment trust, you know, I don't really even consider that a value stock so much. But the fact that it pays a dividend is probably going to be on your other value side of it. Or you just do what, or you just do what I think, just buy the as the, the total stock index and be done with it. You know, VTI, Vanguard Total Index, just done with it. You got everything under the sun when it comes to dividends and growth and value. Uh, you, you, you're done with it. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, did not YouTube is not sending uh, notifications all the time now. Yeah, I, I don't know what, what's going on. Just remember, I do it every Sunday at 730 Eastern time for sure. I, uh, I heard something about them not sending notifications if you host more than two times in 25 hours. So I doubt that. I think YouTube loves the uh, live stream stuff. I guess they're not showing ads right now, though, right? Actually, I'm curious. Are y'all getting ads while this is going on? I don't know how they would. I don't, but maybe they do. I don't know. Uh, have a question. Do you know drag? I don't know what that means. Hello, Donovan. Uh, Pete. What's your thought on preparing a transfer on death deed quick claim where I immediately deed? No ads, right on. Thanks, guys. Uh, where I. All right, cool. Uh, no ads. All right, so maybe YouTube doesn't like it because there are no ads. I don't know. I just remember at the end of the day, if you're doing a YouTube channel, just remember YouTube has one priority make money. For YouTube, that's all there is to it. You always got to remember that. So YouTube has that's its priority. I, look, I don't blame them. I'm a sharecropper, but YouTube always wants to make money for YouTube. So you're starting a YouTube channel. You always got to figure out YouTube will love me if I can make them money. They won't love me if I don't make them money. Just keep that in the back of your mind. So uh, transfer of death, quick claim deed where I immediately deed a remainder of interest in my homestead to my daughter while retaining a life estate. 
Um, yeah. I mean, I, I got no qualm, but it's like a transfer of death account at the, at the investment firm. You're just saying I own it while I'm alive. And at my death, uh, she didn't have to go through the horrific probate char- uh, stuff. I don't think probate is that big of a deal, but uh, no, I got no problem with that, Pete. All right. It looks like we are yeah, right on. Um, let's see, man, we still got 258 on here. That's fantastic. We got 85 thumbs up. Much obliged. Whew, I'm tired, folks. So it's, uh, yeah, almost almost two hours in. Uh, watch, uh, I, uh, Paul, I'm st- big time still proponent of my barbell. So just while I'm thinking here, my barbell approach, CDs and cash and stocks. I am still, oops, got to see my, hold on a sec. I'm still. CDs, cash, and stocks. I just don't like bonds. Now, again, that, that doesn't mean I'm freaking, you shouldn't buy bonds. I mean, just for me, I just, CDs. All right, so for me, and right on, Carl, uh, for me, CDs are better than bonds because they pay equivalent interest rates with no downside risk at all. They just don't. So I'm like, why buy a bond if I can buy a CD with with less risk and similar yield? Uh, uh, I'm still not quite sure what you're saying here. I I mean, I definitely can help folks with a minimized taxes and asset allocation. Absolutely. I just can't, I can't like, I don't manage account to say we're going to move it from point A to point B. And I can advise you uh, on kind of thoughts in that regard, but I, I just, I don't get involved with actually managing a money or moving a money or anything like that, or I mean, just basic recommendations is just in, is index funds for the most part. So um, I, I just want to be clear when people are looking to hire me that I'm not a money manager, have no desire to be, I don't think anyone needs money managers. Um, I don't hate on them. I just think it's, I, I think it's a business model that's dying. Uh, and, and because that, I, I think there's a whole hell of a lot of people that need real life financial planning advice and are willing to pay fees for it. And I just, I think the market is there. It's just the financial advisors are so accustomed to uh, making lots of money without much work. I mean, let's, let's be honest. How much work is it uh, to manage assets using ETFs? Not that much. And my man Carl here is paying 900 bucks a month. Ah, eh, screw that, man. No one's, I mean, that's, think about that. That's freaking, what, $11,000 a year. I, for some dude to freaking, it's just, it's a dying, dying business. And I frankly can't wait for it to die and die a death where it says, we're going to do fee for services. We're going to charge you for the fees we feel we're deserving for financial planning. And that's what I do. It just as an FYI, just while I'm yapping, my fees are quite simple. If you have $500,000 or less in liquid assets, not net worth, liquid assets, that's not including your home, a vacation home, or your ski chalet in France because you're hoity toity. You drink your tea like this. Ready? This is how you drink your tea. I'm going to try to do it. Uh, this is too heavy with my thing like that. Um, yeah, if you have liquid net worth, as IRAs, 401ks, cash at the bank, you know, I, Theoretic, I could say annuities, uh, cash value, life insurance. Yeah, you know, that's <laughs> yeah. But if you, essentially it's 401ks, TSP, 403Bs, IRAs, whatnot, taxable accounts, and money at the bank. If it's less than 500,000 bucks, my friends, I charge uh, 950 bucks. If it's over 500,000 bucks, I charge 2,500. It's uh, it's, it's couldn't be any simpler. Um, and I offer no guarantees that you'll be happy. I just, I offer you, I will tell you the truth. <laughs> on what I, I, I promise I will not lie to you. And if I got to share bad news, I'm going to share bad news. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a unique relationship for sure. Um, I, I, I always feel bad saying this because I feel like it's a, a scarcity sales tactic. I imagine at some point that uh, the regulators are going to say, you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Um, and to, I don't know what it would be, frankly, because um, I don't manage any money. I literally don't know, but I can only imagine at some point uh, they're going to make me jump through hoops to continue doing these YouTube channels if I want to continue to take clients. I, look, I have no idea when, I don't know if it's going to be. Uh, but the regulations on this business is huge. And I, I know I'm pissing a lot of people off. Let's just put it that way. And because of that, I can see um, that 
pissed off people will uh, will work against me with the regulatory agencies, if that makes sense. And at some point, I'm going to have to decide to continue doing YouTube or to jump through these vast amount of hoops uh, where I can't say what I want to say in order to take clients. And at that point, I won't take clients anymore because I will never stop this. I like this. Um, and I don't, you know, I mean, hell, I don't know what it'll be. It might never be, but I could, I'm telling you, man, as the channel gets bigger and more and more financial advisors get on here, and I can tell who these people are my way because they always get pissed off when I talk about, you know, the insanity of, of charging 900 bucks a month for money management. It's, it's freaking insane. And, uh, and because of that, you know, I look, cause I'm encroaching on their, on their business. I get that. I'm literally telling people to fire their financial advisor and go a different route, but I'm telling people to do that for the benefit of the client, but actually for the benefit of the financial advisory industry as well. It's insane. how many people don't trust us uh, to tell them right from wrong. And I, but I can't blame the consuming population because we've been like that for years. I mean, think about it. If you're a financial advisor and you get paid 1% of your assets under management and someone's paying you $900 a year, a month, a month, and that guy says, look, I'm thinking about paying off my house, which is going to reduce your fee from $900 a month to $650 a month, you're in kind of say, don't do that. that just, that's a conflict of interest for sure. I mean, why? why I don't care for an RIA, for fee only, if you're, for, I, don't, I don't care. That's still, you're going to be in a kind of say, no, don't do that. I can do better returns than the interest you're paying. Uh, to the bank. And you might be able to, but you might not be able to. And and if you don't, you're not paying that money back as a financial advisor. Yeah, it's just as crazy. So my man Carl here could go to American funds and he could buy American funds with no freaking sales charge at all and have better portfolio, I would bet, than what he's got now, net of fees. And how many advisors are going to say that who are RIAs or fee only? None, because they don't get feed. <sighs> crazy. Uh, love the barbell approach. All right on, Jim. Can I move individual owned stocks to newly open Roth? No. I think only cash can go into Roth IRAs. You'd have to talk to your custodian on that. Hey, thanks, Al Katrine. Oh, Vic says we appreciate the honesty you convey. Right on, Vic. Appreciate that. I don't think CDs are 1.5 percent, Vic. Someone was telling me they got uh, 2.7 at Suncoast uh, Credit Union the other day. Look at that. The Pats are still down by 10, and the Braves still have the ball. It's freaking freaking Brady doing anything. Um, Suncoast Credit Union in Florida was paying 2.7 on some kind of. Uh, you got to find a credit union. That's where the CDs are. So MDF says, quit claim, have her paying more in taxes. Huh, why? I'm not sure why that would. Um, I, so I'm not sure. Uh, Josh, the two whole, boin, whole bone in pork loans I dry cured and smoked, I told you I was working on, uh, turned out great. You have to give it a try yourself. So Greg May, you need to do a YouTube channel and show us how to do that. The two whole bone in pork loans I dry cured and smoked, I told you. Ooh, that sounds freaking. Um, I, uh, man, I made some steaks tonight and some, uh, pork chop, bone in pork chops. And believe it or not, I cannot believe I'm saying this. Someone, please. I think I might have, uh, this, I might be, uh, my evil brother I actually like the pork chops a little bit better tonight. I don't know why. Maybe it's I haven't had pork chops for a while. I literally put no spice, just salt and pepper. I didn't even put any olive oil. I put nothing on either. They're both medium rare. And those pork chops tasted freaking awesome. I, I, I'm stunned, stunned. And I had, I, uh, I can't remember what kind of cut I had, but man. Uh, do I have a fiduciary responsibility, says uh, Matt. Um, yes, uh, yes, uh, I'm a fiduciary. I don't think that means crap, frankly. And the reason I say it is because fiduciaries uh, charge my man, Carl K, uh, 900 bucks a, a month to manage his money. Would a fiduciary actually do that for himself, his wife, his mom? I, I just, I don't think so. I, I, I just feel like the fiduciary thing is so overblown. I just, I'm sick of it. The idea that a guy who charges commission is any less conflict of interest than a guy who's a fiduciary, it's nuts. I just, I, I, I it, 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 it's one of those things that people are, are grasping to say, look, I'm better than my competitors because I'm a fiduciary and that guy's not. 
And look, I love my man Dustin Tibbetts over at Jazz Wealth. I know he talks about his fiduciary responsibility. I love him to death. He's a great guy. Highly, I highly recommend him. The fiduciary thing is not the reason he's good. I wish, I mean, Frank, I wish he would stop using that because that's not why he's good. He's good because he freaking gives a crap and he gives it his all every single day to every single one of his customers. I know because I've seen him do it. And I know we got people on here who are Dustin's clients who uh, respect him and like him explicitly and recommend him. Um, and, but he's a fiduciary. But the fiduciary is what makes him good. What makes him good is Dustin. And he's get over that stupid fiduciary thing, in my opinion. But that's what some people use because they're worried that they don't have another selling point. And uh, I think honesty is the best selling point. I'd say if I'm not a fiduciary, yeah, I'm not a fiduciary because I still serve you the best I would. And, you know, if, if you want that one word in there, uh, is it going to make the difference that I'm a fiduciary versus I'm not? Well, I'm not the guy for you. I think if I was a financial advisor, that's a pretty good sales pitch. Yeah, you got to create your own scarcity. You say, eh, I'm not a fiduciary. Don't think I need to be. I've been doing this for a long time. I'm, a, I'm a honest. I'm going to shoot the, do the best interest for you. And I might even sell you stuff for a commission. I'll tell you how much the commission is. I'll tell you why. I got no qualm with that at all, man. Uh, does a quick clean claim de deed make her an owner in it now or only at death? Well, if that's the case, I don't. A quick claim D makes her an owner in it today or only at the death? Because it said transfer on death arrangement, uh, MEN DF. Transfer on death arrangement would tell me it's, a, it's an inherited property. It's just a, basically a TOD, like an investment account. TOD on an investment account is certainly an inherited property. We still get the step up basis. So I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure about that because it's a, uh, a TOD arrangement through the quick claim deed, a quick claim deed would indicate to me it's a uh, inheritable property. So anyway, I'll leave that to you guys to figure that out. Who asked that? I forgot. Uh, right on, Carl. Gotcha. Yeah, those who say, man, I freaking could not agree more sassed. Uh, those who say you need a mortgage for fill in the blank are the devil. 100% right, man. You don't need a mortgage for, I need a mortgage for a tax reduction. Oh. Uh, Space Coast Credit Union says David right on. All right, not familiar with that. that sounds pretty good. The 55 year old does not apply to IRA money. MDF, sorry, that's not. Uh, yeah, I don't mean to see. I don't mean to be silly on that. Sorry, it doesn't. It's only 401ks that you had in your account after you left that company after the age of 54. So it can't be a 401k from USA that kept at USA if I'm if I haven't separated from service after the age of 54. So I'm 49, let's say I kept my USA 401k account at USA, now I'm 55, I can't tap that in penalty free because uh, I separated from service before 55. Remember, however, for uh, first responders, it's different. First responders is 50, just keep that in the back of your mind. Pass, recover, fumble, doesn't matter. We know what's gonna happen here. Oh, the red zone. They got a field goal. Yeah, great. I'll take it, but freaking Belichick. Belichick. You run the ball first and 10. I'm going to get, oh, no, I'm going to pass on first and 10. I'm going to have it incomplete. And then I'm going to run the ball. I'll have a third, I'm going to get two yards. They don't have third and eight. I do that all the time. Luckily, thank God, I have Tom Brady, who's the most accurate passer ever known in the history of mankind. If Belichick didn't have freaking Tom Brady, whoever calls his plays, Josh McDaniel, whoever, Oh my goodness, they'd be sitting out there in a bridge in a van down by the bridge. Ay, ay. Right on, Jim. Who? Uh, Sandra. Right on, Sandra. Oh, we got it, man. Uh, all right, my friends. I just inherited property, and the lawyer told me how to pay tax when I sell on the asset base when I inherit. Yeah, right. You have to pay tax. So, that's right. So you inherited the property and your lawyer told you, you have to pay taxes on the asset base of the growth from when you when you, when you inherit it versus what the price is, if that makes sense. Ah, we're not talking inheritance tax. No, no, no. I'm ah, no, 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 no. Not talking inheritance tax here, brother. We're talking uh, capital gains tax. That's what we're talking about here. So capital gains tax and inherited property. Inheritance tax is completely different, completely different, right? Inheritance tax, in fact, uh, you know, very few states have an inheritance tax. The federal government does not have one. If you're talking estate tax, 
not an issue unless you live in Massachusetts. But anyway, because uh, there is a state, a state tax in Massachusetts, which is pretty, uh, uh, pretty dastardly. But anyway, an inheritance tax, don't, don't worry about that. Uh, if you have it, uh, no, uh, no, 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 no. If you inherit a property at $500,000, your mom bought it at $200,000 and you inherited a property at $500,000, the date of death. Your mom bought it at $200,000. That's her cost basis. She dies and left it to old Josh at $500,000. I inherit that property and I sell it for $510,000 five days later. I only pay a capital gain tax. This will be a short-term capital gain tax on that ten thousand bucks. That's it. I don't pay anything from the cost basis of two hundred thousand all the way up to the date of death valuation. Nothing whatsoever. I only pay a capital gain tax on the amount from the date I inherited it to whatever I sold it at. Uh, going back to uh, Vic C, keep it for one year. And that ten thousand dollars is long-term capital gains. That's true, but still only ten thousand bucks, or whatever the price is at the date of sale. Does that make sense? I can't stress this enough. It, nothing to do with inheritance tax in this regard. It's just a step up in basis, and then you pay the difference between the date of death valuation and whatever, uh, whatever you sold it for. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no step in basis after death, right? No, 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 no. Uh, Iowa has an inheritance tax. It, uh, and there is an inheritance tax in, uh, in Pennsylvania too, and it's dastardly, dastardly. And Maryland still has both inheritance and estate tax. Freaking rat things. New Jersey got rid of their estate tax, or do they get rid of their inheritance tax so they could tax gasoline? New Jersey used to have a horrible one, which is good for financial planners because I talk to people in New Jersey all the time who didn't know a freaking crap about what the hell their stupid state was doing to them. And the minute I said, "Oh, okay, so you're okay with paying an estate tax." What, what, what? Oh, yeah, yeah. Anything over 675, you're paying estate tax. Oh, okay, it's okay. You don't want to talk to financial planner because you get it all worked out. That's fine. I used to say that, but hey, you know, okay, just remember you got a $2 million estate, which includes your life insurance and your home. Uh, okay, you're going to be owing estate tax on 1.3 million. But hey, no, 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 no worries. It's cool, man. It's cool. You got it figured out. You got it figured out. That's funny because you, some of the because New Jersey notorious for you know the arrogance and I say I just remember talking to people in, in seminars and uh, in sales pitches I make you know they have a couple million bucks in IRA. <laughs> it's just I remember this one doctor came in. I, this guy was such a freaking ass clown. I was like, dude, cocky as the day is long, and uh, uh, I, I mean, I don't know, he lived in, uh, in Morris, was it Morristown or uh, anyway, some wealthy part of New Jersey, South Jersey. I think it was Morristown and uh, not Morristown, but Morristown. And he just knew it all. And, uh, and I'll never forget. He said, why should I pay you? This is back when I was managing money. I think we're charging 75 basis points because he had a sizable asset base to manage my money when I can have it done it for free at Vanguard. And I said, OK, well, um, what have you done for estate tax? He goes, there's no estate tax for me. I said, really? I said, what, do you live in New Jersey, right? He goes, yeah. I said, oh, okay. Because when I showed him the form, I said, New Jersey, and real quick from the New Jersey uh, Department of Revenue, whatever it's called. said, New Jersey has a $675,000 estate tax, which includes all assets. You can leave it to your spouse tax-free, but then it's taxed to your heirs. And I forgot what the rate was at that point. We're talking 10 years ago. And I'll never forget, he like, he turned, like he saw a ghost. And on top of that, New Jersey had an inheritance tax too, which is insane as well. If it went sideways, you got crushed. If it went downstream, it was fine to some degree. But anyway, long story short, I'll never forget the look in his face because ah, no, no, my lawyer's got that. And uh, I said, okay, whatever. Get the hell out of here. It's funny because uh, the guy didn't know what he's talking about. And he felt, and I was like, you know, it's okay not to know. It's okay. You don't have to know everything. Your job in this case was a radiologist, I think, or something like that. It was a something. I said, why would you know about this stuff? I mean, help, how many freaking financial planners out there don't know about this? And then, you know, I tell people all the time, life insurance is part of your estate for a calculating estate tax. And to a man, they all say, no, it's not. It's tax-free. I sit there and say, oh, my goodness, it's income tax free. It's not estate tax free. If you own it, it's in your estate. If you are the owner of a life insurance policy, it is in your estate. If you live in Massachusetts and you are the owner of a million dollar life insurance policy, you immediately, 
immediately have estate tax to contend with without even thinking about anything else, your house, your 401k, your IRAs and all that. And then on top of that, your qualified assets, not only are subject to the state of Commonwealth of Massachusetts estate tax, they're still subject to income tax from the feds and they're still subject to income tax from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Bah! All right, I guess I'm done here. Uh, yeah, me too, man. All right, guys, we'll see you all Wednesday live stream. Look for some videos tomorrow. I will do one on uh, Right Capital tomorrow. I promise I am getting tired, so I am out of here. Uh, we'll see you guys later. Thanks again for being here. Appreciate all your support and uh, God bless. Thanks now. And I got to end meeting.